Hello, fellow truth seekers. Please visit our website, ChristGnostic.com. We are here for you and love bringing you educational content. Please consider making a donation at our website. Much love and respect to all. Hello, we're uh, once again, we're with Ralph Ellis uh, and Dr. Robert Price and me, Bishop Taylor, Ray Taylor. Um, and he's going to give us a uh, presentation on climate change today. I hope everybody tunes in and has a great time. This should be very informative. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. There's Dr. Uh, Ralph. Go ahead, brother. Right. Good to be with you again. Good to see you, Robert. So uh, mm -hmm. the gang's together again. Um, mm -hmm. yep. But we're straying off the um, straight and narrow today because we're going down a different rabbit hole. So obviously, I normally do sort of uh, biblical research. But um, many years ago now, um, I started this in 2005. So no, 2004. So I've been on this a long time. Um, I was getting a bit concerned with the hype on uh, climate change, or as they called it, then global warming, uh, before they changed its name. And I was heavily involved in people discussing uh, CO2 and climate change. And one of the uh, chaps on the site I was uh, inhabiting was a very famous astronomer. And uh, he was answering questions, very knowledgeable, of course. And one of the questions that came up is, why do ice ages happen? You know, we're supposed to know why the climate works in the current era. Remember, the science is settled, as they say. But then when it went back into the past, into uh, the ice ages, nobody knew why they happened in the fashion that they did. Um, they knew broadly what was doing it, but they didn't know precisely what was doing it. And um, I was chatting on... on on the website with this guy, uh, Svalgard. And he said, well, it, you know, the detail doesn't matter. We know the broad brush strokes of why the, the, these things happen. And I'm thinking, no, that, that's not good enough. We need to know the detail. If you don't know the detail, you don't know why these ice ages are happening. And maybe that detail is important. And so that set me off on a a very deep dive into uh, orbital mechanics and weather and feedback agents and all of the aspects of climate science, uh, which took me probably a, a couple of years. And then I came up with this um, very rough and ready article, which said, this is why ice ages happen. And uh, someone read it and said, well, that's actually rather clever. Why don't you turn it into a proper peer review science paper? And I said, yes, sounds nice, but I've got no idea how to do it. And he said, well, I'm a professor and I can guide you through the process of how to uh, write a peer review paper. And I can help you out with all of the diagrams and so on, because I wasn't so good at generating all of the graphs that were necessary. And so he said, right, before we start this little exercise, you will need to read this. And he sent me a package of 70 science papers on paleoclimatology. He said, you can't write a um, proper peer review paper unless you review all of these hmm. papers. So not only do you understand the current um, science, as it were, the current thinking, but also that you can cite and review these these particular papers. So that's what I did. So I buried myself um, in these papers for quite some time. And then I started to rewrite my little article. And uh, Michael Palmer helped me, Professor Palmer, uh, with all of the graphs. And we came out with a proper science paper. Now, we sent it off to the Royal Society because they are a journal who will print papers, and it got rejected for what I would consider to be stupid reasons, and we can go through some of those reasons later, perhaps. But one of the reasons, of course, was because it did not agree with CO2 global warming, uh, which I thought was a bit strange. 
Um, so, uh, so we took stock and um, I took it to another journal and uh, they said, yeah, this is fine. This is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And so they passed it through peer review. Obviously, there were changes that had to be made, as always happens in peer review. Uh, they wanted more citations and various other things. Mm. And it was published as a peer review science paper. And it's been very successful. It's had 45,000 downloads, which is quite a lot for a peer mm. review paper. You know, a lot of these papers now, people within science are chucking out papers left, right, and center. Instead of having, you know, in a lifetime, you know, 30 really good papers, people are now doing hundreds of <laughs> papers. Oh. Um, they, they, they call it um, paper inflation. So instead of having like two people on a paper, you'll get 30 people put their names on a paper because the more times you get cited on different papers, the more marks you get uh, in various journals and so on. Uh, it sort of gives you more clicks. And so people get multiple papers nowadays instead of um, uh, just one or two. And therefore, the papers are only read by two or 300 people. <laughs> So to get 45,000 reads is, is pretty good on a paper. And yeah. it's never been challenged. So mm. no one's actually challenged my uh, paper. A lot of people said, oh, yes, but he's not a proper climate scientist. Yeah, but that's not a, <laughs> that, that's not a, a counter to my, um, to my paper. Um, so this is it. And I think because it's, it's, it's a long paper. It's it's like thirty paper, uh, thirty pages, I think, something like that. Um, but it's relatively simple to explain, and I'm not going to go into the detail of it. We'll do this in broad brush strokes. But it's relatively easy to explain, and I think we can do this in about uh, fifteen twenty minutes or so. Mm -hmm. So what I was going to do is do a quick screen share and bring it up on. Keynote. So I've got a Keynote program because I'm an Apple user. And um, so if I bring up Keynote, that should be coming up in Keynote. Bingo. Mm. And then I can play it. And it should get a bit bigger then. So does it get it? Does that yes. get bigger so it makes it easier mm -hmm. to see? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Excellent. Okay. So uh, hopefully it will play. So I will just go through my little presentation. So um, that's Las Vegas, actually, just being covered by a sandstorm. And that's sort of relevant because uh, we're, we're going to be talking about dust. Hmm. Um, instead of CO2, you see, I changed this a little bit. I don't invoke CO2. I invoke dust. And there's a good reason for that. So it's How Ice Ages Happen by myself, Ralph Ellis, because this, um, I should really call it Ice Age Modulation, shouldn't I? Because that's the name of the uh, paper. So this is the paper published in Geoscience Frontiers. I can, and it's modulation. I can make that. See if I can make that full screen. Let's see if I can get it. There you go. Go ahead. Ah, OK. That's even better. Lovely. Mm -hmm. It's called Modulation of Ice Ages uh, by Procession and Dust Albedo Feedbacks by myself, Ralph Ellis, and uh, Professor Michael Palmer. And uh, yes, yeah, so this is back in, when was it published? 2016, it says. So it's, it's been out for quite a while now. And it still remains unchallenged. Wow. So, um, and it's, it's the first paper, I have to add this, it's the first paper that fully explains all of the nuances of the Ice Age cycle, because this has remained a mystery uh, for hundreds of years. So uh, here on the bottom, this first graph is temperature versus CO2. Uh, and on the bottom, we've got 800,000 years of data. This is taken from uh, the Epica II ice core down in Antarctica. Um, so we've got uh, temperature in red and CO2 in blue, and uh, they are in lockstep together, as you can see. And some people have erroneously assumed from that that CO2 is controlling temperature. 
that's where we get this idea that CO2 uh, controls temperature. But of course, if we look at this graph in a slightly different fashion, oh, but do bear in mind, correlation does not imply causation. You need a rationale, you need evidence for causation, and we don't have that between CO2 and temperature. Uh, alternatively, we can look at this and say that every time CO2 is high, the world cools. And every time CO2 is low, the world warms. <laughs> this was the conundrum that set me looking at this problem because, um, you know, the people we were discussing with this many years ago said, well, that, that's a little bit incidental. We don't need to know those nuances. Well, yes, this is fairly fundamental, actually, mm. um, because we could say that high CO2 causes cooling and low CO2 causes warming. The opposite of what is normally expected. Now, it's more complicated than that, as we will see. But this does give you an idea that um, there are possibly other feedback agents involved in uh, temperature control on the planet because this would not happen if CO2 was a very strong greenhouse gas. Hmm. So, yeah, that's what set me off on this little um, escapade looking at paleoclimate. So if it's not CO2, which is implied by this graph, then what is the controlling agent? Well, um, the one aspect that has been known for a hundred years is the orbital cycles. They are involved somehow. So the first of these, we're not going to talk about these too much because it's 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 not necessary. But um, the three orbital factors that that control climate are the precession of the Earth's axis. That's the Earth wobbling on its axis, which it does every twenty six thousand years or for climate, it does it every 22,000 years. Um, obliquity, that's the leaning angle of the Earth, uh, which is currently 23.4 degrees, if I remember correctly. Now that changes, um, and it has a cycle of 40,000 years, 41,000 years. And eccentricity of the Earth's orbit, how close the Earth is to the Sun. Sometimes it's a bit closer, sometimes it's a bit further away. And if you mix all of those three um, cycles together, you end up with Milankovitch, oh, and apsidal precession, but we won't bother with that one. That's um, uh, <laughs> a lot of people forget about apsidal precession. Um, if you mix those together, you get the Milankovitch cycle. Uh, which was discovered by Mr. Milankovic, of course, who was a, a, a mathematician and astronomer from, uh, from the Balkans, uh, one of those Balkan states. And he did all of these calculations to get these um, graphs of, uh, you know, the Milankovic cycle it was all done before we had computers. So it was all done on slide rules, which was um, fairly clever. And that gives us the great year. Now, normally the great year, when we're talking about this in terms of uh, Egyptian history and so on, it's normally 26,000 years. But for climate, due to apsidal precession, it's slightly shorter and it's only 23, 22, 23,000 years long. Um, but we know this cycle quite well because it's been calculated by um, Pierre Lascar uh, from Paris, and he's calculated the all of these cycles back to about 25 million years. So it's a fairly well understood um, function of the Earth's <coughs> orbit. And what it does, <clears throat> I called it the great year in, in astronomy and so on, they don't call it the great year. Um, I call it the great year because it's easier to understand that way, because it acts very much like an annual year does. An annual year when it's warm in the north, when it's summer in the north, it's winter in the south. Well, the great year does exactly the same. When it's warm in the north, it's winter in the south. But this year is 23,000 years long instead of 
being just one year. And of course, that will have an effect on climate. So it's simul similar to an annual year, but obviously much longer. So those are the orbital cycles, and uh, we can draw some graphs from that. And here is one of those um, one of those graphs. Um, so this one is the great year, the Milankovic cycle, versus temperature. Now along the bottom here, we've got 450,000 years of data on this occasion. Again, it's taken from the Epica 3 ice core down in Antarctica. And um, uh, in red, we have temperature, because the temperature changes quite a lot uh, during the ice ages. At the poles, it changes by like 12 to 14 degrees centigrade. So that's quite a big change. Um, and the blue cycle here is the great year or the Milankovitch cycle. So the blue line going upwards means it's warmer in the northern hemisphere. And the blue line going downwards means it's colder. So at the top, it's a great summer a northern hemisphere great summer at the bottom is a northern hemisphere great winter and that will have quite an effect on the temperatures in the northern hemisphere and as you can see uh, temperature in red seems to follow the great year so every time we get a spike a great summer in the northern hemisphere uh, we get some extra warming. And I think I've got yeah, some arrows that come along. So let's do those. So a great summer in the uh, Northern Hemisphere gives us warming and it gives us an interglacial. We're in an interglacial at present uh, known as the Holocene. So this is us here, a uh, year zero. So we're in an interglacial. Normally, the world is much colder but we're in an interglacial, and that's why we have nice, fine weather. Um, the trouble is, and, and so this has been known for, you know, 100 years, that uh, interglacials are caused in some manner uh, by great summers, processional great summers in the Northern Hemisphere. So they are controlling, to some extent, they are controlling the Ice Age cycle. The problem is... And we can see the problem here is that a lot of these great summers do not produce any warming. And here's quite a lot of them that produce no warming, especially this one here, looking at 230,000 years ago. This is a very, very strong great summer. Um, and it didn't cause very much warming at all. Look at these two here, very recent. So this one's about... 80,000 years ago. This one's about 110,000 years ago. Two quite strong great summers in the Northern Hemisphere, and they produced no warming whatsoever. That has always been the problem with um, classical explanations for the Ice Age cycle. Why is the temperature response selective? You have a constant cycle, the Milankovitch cycle, the great year cycle, but the temperature only responds sometimes and not on other occasions. How can you have a selective response to a forcing? Um, it's unlikely to be CO2 is the feedback because CO2 is a global gas um, which doesn't spike during these occasions for some reason, during these great summers. It's unlikely to be uh, CO2 is the feedback, especially because this only happens with northern hemisphere um, great summers, with northern hemisphere warming. It doesn't occur with southern hemisphere great summers that's unusual if it was co2 you would expect a global response but we don't we have a hemispherical response and we have an intermittent response which is a bit odd so i think the true feedback is ice 
sheet albedo, which is the reflectivity of the ice. So we can have a look at that. What is ice sheet albedo? Well, very simply, uh, if we take an ice sheet, um, we get the sun during a great summer. And on the ice, it has an albedo, a very high albedo. Its reflectivity is very high. And all of that radiation will disappear straight back uh, into, into space. And something like 95% of the incident energy will go straight back into space. Um, and that's why the world remains cold, because all of that energy is being reflected. Now, how do we stop this happening? Uh, so how do we create an interglacial? Well, we cover the ice sheets with dust, of course, and then the dust can absorb that energy and it can warm the ice and it can melt the ice, it can ablate the ice, and the great ice sheets all disappear. So that's the idea. But how do we get dust? And this was one of the main things that got this paper actually published um, because you have to have something that is completely novel within a paper to get it published and this was certainly a very novel item um, so how do we get dust well it's through co2 so what's the difference between these plants well the difference is co2 of course those on the left have high co2 those on the right have very little um, so co2 is plant food and the most essential gas in the atmosphere. Without CO2, all life on Earth would die. Now, we're sitting here at 400 parts per million, uh, and the plants are doing reasonably well. Um, but if we gave them more CO2, they would do even better, which is why uh, greenhouse growers put extra CO2 into their greenhouses to make the plants grow better. <laughs> But during the Ice Age, uh, CO2 came down to 190 parts per million. And up on the highlands of uh, uh, Asia, um, the equivalent CO2 went down to 150 parts per million. At which point, of course, all the plants die. And that is the key to this, because during the Ice Age maximum, uh, we had 190 parts per million CO2. And uh, at altitude uh, in the Asian plateau, it went down to 150 parts per million. And low CO2 equals plant death, as you can see from the image above. And plant death equals CO2 deserts. Now, everyone is familiar with uh, precipitation deserts. If you have no rain, you, the plants die and you get a desert but you can also have CO2 deserts. So if you don't have enough CO2, the plants die and you get a CO2 desert. And that, that actually happened during the last ice age. So never mind this business with having too much CO2. The real problem during the last, last ice age is we had so little CO2 in the atmosphere that all of the planet nearly died. Because if you go below 150, I mean, 150 parts per million is the death zone <clears throat> for all life on Earth. So if you go down to 150 parts per million, all the plants die, all the animals die, and you end up with a barren world because everything is dead. So that is the real problem with CO2. Not that we've got too much, but that we have too little and the world nearly ended. So, <clears throat> CO2 deserts, they cause dust. Now, that is key because not many people have um, picked up on this. Um, dusty ice sheets will cause warming. If you get dark, if you get dark dust uh, on the ice sheets, the ice sheets will warm, they will melt, uh, and you get an interglacial. And that is exactly what happened. So here's um, an image of CO2 versus dust. 
again taken from the Epica 3 ice core. So uh, on the bottom, we have 800,000 years of data with all of the last major ice ages. So we've got CO2 on the top. Um, and um, remember that CO2 is proportional to temperature. So this represents temperature change as well. So each of these peaks is an interglacial. And this is our latest interglacial over here, which is the Holocene. And we can see on here, I've shaded it in where CO2 is low. You look down and dust is high. So every time we come across a shaded portion, CO2 is low, dust is high. CO2 is low, dust is high. Every time uh, CO2 drops below 190 parts per million, we get an extraordinary amount of dust a lot of dust. Um, and so every interglacial is preceded by 10,000 years of dust. So instead of having CO2 as a trigger for warming, so instead of CO2 causing warming as a feedback agent, perhaps it was dust that was doing this. Um, so I've got some arrows we can look at here. So every time CO2 is low, dust is high. Interesting. Wow. So we have another possible feedback agent. The feedback agent may well be dust. And now we can look at temperature versus dust. Very much the same sort of graph, but this time we're going to look the other way around because dust may be causal it may be causing the temperature change. So every time dust is high, we get warming. Every interglacial is preceded by 10,000 years of dust. So instead of having CO2 as the feedback agent, which controls interglacials and therefore the ice age cycle, um, we end up with dust. And that would explain, um, it would explain the intermittency, the missing um, uh, great summers in the Northern Hemisphere, the Milankovitch cycles. Remember previously, we had very strong warming in the Northern Hemisphere, a great summer in the Northern Hemisphere, and nothing happened. Why did nothing happen? Well, because we had bright white ice and that was just reflecting all of that energy away. So the sun, the extra sun during a great summer could not get a grip on the Earth's climate. It could not give any warming. But if you cover those ice sheets with dust, so now they're quite dark, you get a lot of warming. And that amount of warming is can be huge. It's like... Um, something like 40% extra warming. So it's, it's a huge amount of extra warming um, that you get by having d dirty ice sheets. So interglacial warming is not due to CO2 directly. It's only indirectly via dust and in an opposite sense. So what do we mean by that? Well, we mean that low CO2 causes CO2 deserts, therefore causes dust, therefore causes warming because of the low albedo. Mm. And that is why it is low CO2 that causes warming, not high CO2. We only get into glacials when CO2 is low. And that's not due to CO2 directly. That's because CO2 kills off all of the plant life uh, and form CO2 deserts. So that's the reverse sense that we get um, from this paper. So in summary, so we're nearly at the end of this, 20 minutes, that's not too bad. In mm. summary then, ice age cooling is caused by orbital cycles. We've known this for a hundred years. So when we have a great winter, in the northern hemisphere, we end up with a lot of cooling and that causes the ice sheets to grow. 
Ice ages are maintained by ice sheet albedo, the high reflectivity of bright white ice, which can reflect away all of the incoming insulation, we call it, or the inbound energy from the sun. <clears throat> Sunlight, basically. Ice ages are ended by dust lowering the ice sheet albedo, the reflectivity of the ice, uh, making them darker. And if they're darker, they're going to absorb more energy, which allows sunlight absorption and warming, which it will do, of course. I mean, you see that um, in the spring when you see uh, dirty snow on the roadside, and it's the dirty snow that will um, will uh, melt first before the bright white snow. Mm -hmm. Dust is caused by CO2 deserts, not precipitation deserts, but CO2 deserts. A lot of people don't like this expression because it's inflammatory, I think they think, because it's giving a very negative view of CO2. You can have a CO2 desert if you don't have enough CO2. Uh, all the plants will die and you'll get a desert. So CO2 deserts are caused by low CO2, of course, because that will cause plants to die. Uh, thus, low CO2 causes interglacial warming. <laughs> Interesting. So it's totally the opposite of every other paper that has been published on um, paleoclimate because they were all obsessed by CO2 so they were looking at the wrong potential agent for warming and so they all got the wrong answer and that's why I could sneak in under the radar as it were and come out with this paper because scientists are not paid to look at um, other options there was a, a a group wanted to study for modern climate they wanted to study Chinese industrial dust on the northern ice sheets. It was called the Dark Snow Project. In a similar fashion to my paper, they were going to look at um, <clears throat> whether Chinese industrial dust is the agent that causes the Arctic to melt. Not CO2, but industrial dust getting on the ice and therefore making the ice darker and therefore melting. And they only got one year of funding and then their funding was pulled because they were not looking at CO2 as, a, as an option. So this, yeah, this is a problem with modern science. There's no freedom of uh, thought, no freedom of exploration, and there's no freedom of publication. Um, so, so yeah, this is all the opposite of classical climate claims. Uh, and if true for paleoclimate, perhaps true for the present climate as well via the agent of uh, Chinese industrial dust. Wow. And if CO2 is not causing present warming, then there's no need for any net zero expenditure. So yes, all of that uh, net zero expenditure that we're spending at present might be a complete waste of time um, and a complete waste of our tax money. Um, that's why these things are important to explore because we're spending trillions of dollars on this net zero escapade, which may be totally futile if we've got the wrong agent ah. by which warming is is, is uh, caused. So yeah. So yes, net zero fi finance is possibly being wasted. That's why we need to do something about it. Wow. And that is the end. Modulation of ice ages by dust and albedo. Amazing. Um, yeah, so that's a, an interesting interesting take on, on climate, yes. Well, what sort of response has this gotten besides the cold shoulder, no pun intended? <laughs> oh, I've had quite a few cold shoulders <laughs> yeah um climate scientists don't want to engage very much with this um so i've actually tried to chat with them uh on uh, sites i've sent them individual yeah. questions to their inboxes uh to their institutions 
and they won't engage. I won't even get any explanation as to why I'm potentially wrong. Uh, they won't point out, oh, no, you're wrong because of this or that. You know, no. Well, no I response. Mean, they won't engage. Yeah, well, typically uh, their findings are who are paying them the most, I guess. Yeah, I'm, I'm going against the grain, which doesn't help. Um, if they do engage, they might lose funding because they can't um, they can't go along with with my explanation because it's against everything that academia says. The best way they can deal with it is just to ignore it. However, on the other side, I've had a lot of support from individuals, of course. That's why this paper has had so many downloads, hmm. uh, because other people look at this and say, hey, that makes sense. You know, nothing I've been told previously about Ice Age cycles has made full sense, whereas this explains every facet hmm. of the Ice Age cycle. And therefore, well, yeah, we can understand this. It's simple. It's logical. We can go along with this. Thumbs up, you know. So I've had a lot of encouragement from, um, you know, general readers and so on. But um, not much from the climate fraternity. This okay. is a perfect example of what uh, Thomas Kuhn talks about in the structure of scientific revolutions, that a new paradigm comes up that explains things more economically and uh, without all the epicycles, so to speak, the, uh, the lame, uh, extreme, contrived uh, re-explanations, but uh, it, it always meets resistance or silence among the old guard because they have too much invested in the, the old paradigm. And uh, maybe they just can't think out of the box, but maybe it's just covering their butts. Who knows? The result is the same. But eventually people will, uh, a new generation, it's like they have to die off first. And the new generation says, yeah, I, I think, for instance, continental drift makes a lot of sense. And eventually that becomes the orthodoxy. So, you know, who knows if we'll live to see it, but that will happen. Yeah, I think it will. Um, but it's, it's currently generating quite a lot of opposition. I mean, even those, <coughs> those clowns who are opposing yourself and myself in the uh, biblical research, <laughs> they were on about this as, as well and saying, oh, you can't believe what Ellis says. He's a climate denier. And you think, oh, hold on a minute. You know, you, the clowns, know nothing about climate science whatsoever, but you're going to try and denigrate me for some uh, on, on a topic uh, about w which you know nothing whatsoever. But this is what they do. They're, they're so confident in their ignorance mm -hmm. that they will happily denigrate someone uh, and just use the, the standard epithets, the same as you've had, you know, oh, you're a misogynist, you're a racist, whatever they want to call you, you mm -hmm. know. Um, I'm sure you've had enough of it as, as I've had enough. Um, but that's what they'll do because they can't argue against it. So mm. what do they have left? They'll try. <laughs> they definitely try, yes. Yeah, and it's they, just um, the stupidest approach to just start name-calling and so on and appeal to the, the ignorant majority. I, I don't see how they can not see that. Or if they do, how can they live with themselves? Huh? <laughs> yes. Yes, mm, yeah. it, it is. It is bizarre. You know, if, if I'm if I'm on a subject that I don't know so much about, I will be very cautious what I say, because I, mm. I will know that I can get shot down in flames because mm -hmm. I might be wrong on that topic. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you tread cautiously. But not these people. No, they know nothing about a particular subject, uh, but they will go all in. Mm -hmm. um, same as they went all in with with my aviation. Uh, evidence that I was pointing out as well hmm. um, about and the they fire. Were trying to, yeah, they were trying to say that they know more about aviation, having never been in a cockpit. Um, and yet, you know, I've got forty thousand. No, sorry, I've I've been flying for forty years. I've got twenty thousand hours in in aircraft, and I think fifteen thousand hours in heavy jets. I think I know hmm. a little bit more about aviation than. The clowns who were opposing us, uh, it, it, and yet they will still try and comment and still try and denigrate. It's, it's quite absurd. 
it's, it's almost um, like if you go back to the the Roger Revelle. Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't heard the name. Not quite sure what what he's famous for. Roger Revelle back in the '50s was giving a um, getting paid grant money to to uh, understand carbon's effect on the environment. Okay, he was in California. He went to Harvard University. Or he taught at Harvard, Harvard University, and Al Gore took a class. He was the D student. Okay, Maurice Strong in the um, in the United Nations came to him in 1989 and said, "Would you back our research or help us because we want to um, basically create a crisis, you know, um, to give the United Nations power and to get these treaties and all this garbage in, right?" Yep. He said, sure, I'll do it. Then Roger Reville started dying. And uh, in his deathbed confession that they've removed off the Internet, which I've got a copy of, I can upload, but I'm not going to upload it to my channel because immediately they'll kick it off. But it's Roger Reville said that with further research must must go on because this is not right. Uh, he understood uh, that it was a deathbed confession. Well, after he died. Al Gore used him as a model called the Roger Reveal, like these uh, uh, trophies and this awards that he gave himself. A D student gave himself all these awards, and he said that Roger Reveal was uh, senile. He had Alzheimer's. There's no, all the doctors said no. He was writing science papers until the last week of his death. and uh, But no one knows any of this. It's all hidden. And then they had the Earth Summit in 1992. With the Beach Boys and all the all the psychopaths over there, well, um, all the nuts, roots and nuts, you know, they were there and they just want a cause. Um, so they got this bogus cause, this climate cause. Oh, they're just so you know, like uh, virtue signaling, like we're in a mask in a car with a freaking shield um, by yourself because a steering wheel might give you the AIDS virus. You know, <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. You know, it's like uh, it's like masturbating with a condom on. You know, that's what I, like that. that, you know, I mean, that's what it is. And uh, you're gonna catch a disease from your hand, all right? So the, the thing is, it's uh, all of this boils down to uh, this this hysterical hysterical nonsense of the chicken running. What's well, chicken little? The sky is falling, right? And these billionaires like uh, BlackRock, like the World Economic Forum, Forum, um, the Fuhrer, Klaus Schwab, mm -hmm. um, you know, like that. Um, and then you have the idiot, the, the guy in the White House that's uh, completely do doesn't know who he is. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, and, like, like uh, anyone else. <laughs> yeah, he's in. Anyway, yeah, he's walking around. What you ever seen the movie Ricky Bobby? What do I do with my hands? You know, he's talking to the. He doesn't no, know, no. And, and Biden either. But that's political nonsense. But climate change is uh you know I, I can't say that 100 percent anything about it on youtube because it's you know but it is what it is and you have to take all this other stuff in consideration too when you're dealing with it it's it's uh who does it benefit that's yeah. the question well it, it benefits politicians and it benefits the people who got in early with it because you know everyone complains about big oil yeah. having lots of money and being highly influential. That is no longer true. The biggest organization on the planet now is Big Green. They control trillions of dollars uh, of our tax money and our energy expenditure money on, you know, whether it's heating or oil or whatever. Um, that now is, is, you know, the biggest organization, as it were, is Big Green. And yeah, yeah. they're using that money. And, um, yeah, yeah they're, they're doing very nicely, thank you. Uh, thank you. And, you know, climate scientists who used to be the poorest people on campus, based in some wooden hut somewhere at the edge of the campus, they're now the center yeah. of the university. And they're, they're the biggest um, bringers of uh, donations to each of the universities. And, you know, they go, they, they run around the world to these conferences in five-star resorts you know every year and oh they're having a wonderful time out of it exactly. um, and the politicians enjoy it as well because it suits their agenda there's a big agenda for um um a one world government 
is essentially what the WEF is looking for. They want a mm -hmm. one world government. But if you want a one world government, you need one world problems to sort out. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there's no need for a one world government. So you need a one world pandemic. You need a one world climate crisis. All of these big problems that only a one world government can sort out. And that's mm -hmm. part of the uh, allure for especially left wing politicians because they want this uh, new world order of a one world government. So, yeah, that's a lot of the rationale behind this. Rara this sounds, like, oh, uh, sorry, this sorry. sounds like the whole AIDS thing where uh, there were a few lone voices saying, wait a minute, uh, there there can't be this long an incubation period and, and there's not even only one HIV virus and so on and so on. Uh-uh, nope, you can't say that because then no more conferences, no more funding. I mean, it seems... <laughs> exactly the same thing i mean people were dying but just like they attributed every every death to to covid recently i mean you might have it but it might not have killed you something else did oh no no it's covid uh the same thing may have been the case since there was no one effect of supposed hiv aids anything could kill you well how'd you get it oh must have been hiv uh and so i'm really having to take a second look at that too and i believe uh rfk jr says that that's what uh uh, what's his name? Uh, Fauci was doing back then as well. It's oh, good God! Oh, yeah, yeah um, and, and there's been many unexplained features of that, which show there was something amiss. One of the ones that's not gone mentioned at all, I think, in the mainstream press, is that the flu disappeared. Hmm. So right. on average, um, you know, we used to get, you know, in Britain, we still got. At the very peak, we used to get 50,000 deaths a year from the flu back in the 50s and 60s. That sort of reduced down to about 20,000, um, maybe 15,000 in recent years. Um, but during COVID, for two years, there was no flu deaths. It disappeared. Same in America. If you look at um, uh, the best graph I think you can find is on the CDC site, uh, which is... Um, Pedio, um, a child deaths from flu, which, you know, flu is still quite deadly. They used to get a few hundred every, every winter from flu deaths. And suddenly in 2000 and uh, the winter of 2020, the winter of 2021, there were no flu deaths whatsoever. It just disappeared. And you've got to ask yourself why. Were they just yeah. counting flu deaths uh as covid but some of the peaks don't match up but if if lockdowns and extra hygiene can get rid of the flu why could it not get rid of covid mm. it rather suggests there was a different transmission route for covid if you can get rid of flu by lockdowns but you can't get rid of covid I made the suggestion a long time ago. This was like three years ago when this first started. Perhaps uh, COVID is actually on cold meats and salads because the Chinese did a big paper saying that COVID can actually live when it's not alive, of course, but um, it can remain active on cold meats and salads for up to three months. So if, if your packing plant and processing part plant for... Uh, 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 supermarket foods has an infection, then that infection can be passed on down through your food chain. And nobody has looked in that at that whatsoever. There was a couple of papers uh, on that uh, from China and everyone dismissed them and then went quiet. But nobody explained why flu then disappeared and there were no flu cases whatsoever. Yeah. Two years. You know, it, it's people have a short memory. Um, you were just talking about Dr. F uh, Fauci, okay? <laughs> Ouchie, get to Ouchie, Fauci, Ouchie. Um, yeah, yeah, Fauci, back in the uh, 80s, uh, the homosexuals were predominantly the AIDS people that were, had AIDS. He kept Bactrim, um, a sulfur drug that was allowing people to die of pneumocystic pneumonia 
in in but in in really large um uh scale thing here and he was keeping back trump he knew it would help them and knew it would keep them alive but he decided in his infinite wisdom to hold that back he's never apologized for it but the homosexuals um of today they've forgotten it they don't know because uh you know different generations you have to be 60 years old to, to really know and who lived i mean uh, these aids people passed that but um back in i was back in 86 i was in washington dc and they had a protest a thing in dc about please let us have bactrum for god's sake like they were begging for ivermectin you know uh. people were okay so anything that comes out of fauci's mouth i wouldn't believe um i mean if satan appeared i'd offer him a cup of coffee but fauci i'd kick him out the door you know, I mean, because I would trust, yes. him, you know, and that's it. I mean, it, it's all this stuff that we're going through, you know, BP started that net zero carbon, you know, because they were trying to get ahead of it so they could continue to sell oil. Um, it's all propaganda. Um, you got these idiots that sit in front of cars, you know, in England and all oh. over the world, these morons. I mean, these climate <laughs> people, because if they, here's the here's the question you have to ask yourself. If they weren't doing that, what would they be doing? Living in their parents' basement, you know, mm. playing video games. They have nothing else to do. They have nothing to live for. I mean, they don't. They used to go to church, you know. I mean, their parents took them to church and they had church events and socials and all that kind of stuff or whatever with the school. But nowadays, if you're not a flaming homosexual and if you don't want to cut off your wiener, nobody cares about you. You know, that's the whole thing. So the kids nowadays are trying to get attention like, well, I've got to, you know, um, do all this nonsense to get attention because if I'm just a regular person, then I'm not as good as the, the guy over here that pretends that he's a female or this mm -hmm. woman over here pretends she's a male. Um, you know, I don't, I don't subscribe to that gender nonsense. Um, there's male and female and then there's a gender identity disorder. Okay, it's not gender euphoria, so I won't subscribe to that. I mean, you know, and I don't care what people think of me. I could care less when it comes to that, but I'm not going to do it. And uh, because it's like uh, glorifying. Okay, if you have schizophrenia, is it like okay? Um, it's okay. We need to celebrate and make a flag for schizophrenias and schizophreniacs and let them walk around with the flag. Um, mm. No, not going to do it. And uh, am I a bigot? Do I, am I a hater? Absolutely not. I just will not. I just will not submit to stupidity. It's just not going to happen. And mm -hmm. um, you know, but this climate change is. Uh, Ralph has some really good points there. I mean, probably. I mean, when I was watching it, I was amazed. I was like, uh, because I was thinking about coal dust. What, what do you think about that, Ralph? I mean, coal, the, the dust, and coal, and smoke. So, sorry, say again. You're breaking up a little bit. The, uh, the, the coal dust. Yeah, like dust from coal. I mean, what would that what would that uh, do? Um, well, there was a paper by um, Pinter et al. Um, which was saying, uh, and this was uh, several years ago. They wrote this um, that the reduction in um, glaciers in the Alps started with the Victorian era and the industrialization of Europe uh, way back then. And they looked, so they obviously drilled th through the glaciers up in the Alps and took ice cores throughout the glacier. And they said it was coincident with the amount of coal dust, of course, you know, products of coal burning um, that started in the, um, uh, in the Victorian era. Because of course, uh, although industry was much smaller, in those days it was much dirtier everybody was using coal for heating and so on so there was an awful lot of soot and so on uh in the atmosphere and uh, they said yeah the um reduction in glaciers in the uh in the alps was due to a reduction in albedo again um because of all of this dark soot that was sitting on on the ice sheets so yeah um this has been hinted at before but you don't hear much about these papers uh in the uh, press at all you you don't get any exposure at all um and that was going to be the subject of my next uh, talk um 
you which have, is all going to be. Your paper or what you've written there, I've read it a couple times, right? It's fascinating. It's not more than fascinating. It's wonderful. It's a person who who has come out to help mankind, basically, you know, like, I mean, to help everyone, humanity. And you looked at it with common sense and reason, which is fast. I mean, just I will applaud you for it. I mean, that's just awesome. I mean, that is, I'm so glad you're on the show. I'm so glad you said like that, that, that report was wonderful. Um, you're, you're thinking, see, you know, it's like, uh, think, investigate, you know, I mean, uh, I think therefore I investigate. I love that one. Yeah. And, and it's simple as well. I'm, uh, if, if you read these science papers on paleoclimatology, it's all modeling, it's complex maths, it's Fourier, um, uh, Fourier formations, they call them, um, doing all of this very complex maths on trying to decide, you know, what is relevant, what's not relevant. I don't have any of that in my paper. It's just pure logic. I've, okay. I've uh, devised my paper in what the Greeks used to do when they used to do, they used to call it rhetoric. Mm. If you had a, an idea, if you had a thesis, uh, you used to explain it to the audience. That's why it was rhetoric. And uh, if it wasn't simple enough to explain to the audience, well, maybe perhaps it was wrong. So I don't have any complex maths in mind. It's, it's literally um, standard high school mathematics uh, and based on logic. And it just makes perfect sense. And um, so that is the proof. And the proof of the pudding is that people cannot have not challenged it um oh. if if it was incorrect people would have uh pointed that out by now uh, but of course they don't what about the ice core samples i mean that's that's a um they keep saying that uh, that proves climate change they were showing it on tv the other day and uh they didn't explain how they didn't explain <laughs> why <laughs> you know but they, well, they it explains it in terms of that some, and this was the argument I was having with the uh, astronomer on uh, back in you know the early 2000s, it explains some of the interglacials, but it doesn't explain all of them. And, and you hmm. cannot have a whole theory if it has big holes in it, lacunas, as they say in, in uh, history. So there is enormous lacunas in, in this diagram, in this explanation, because only one in four of the orbital cycles gives us an interglacial. Mm. And you've got to explain away why there's another four that don't. And uh, it, it's only my paper that manages to explain uh, why we only get one in four climate cycles will give us an interglacial. Um, so yeah, that's why, you know, explaining everything is important. We've, we've got to be able to explain all facets uh, of, of this problem. And, yeah. I'm just um, changing my camera battery while, while you're talking now. I'm not really, okay. I mean, and, uh, um, I, well, I was going to go on to the other presentation I've got. I don't know if you want to do that now. Oh yeah. No, no problem. Uh, that, well, yeah, that'll be good. Hmm. Um, okay. Um, well, I've, this, my second um, presentation here is a bit longer. I think this is about 35 minutes. And this goes through um, climate, current climate, and the case for net zero. Because I think the case for net zero has been, hmm, it's, it's been overblown and very badly calculated. And I think it's been deliberately badly calculated by are people in the industry and by politicians because they want us to force us down this route mm -hmm. even though this route is 10 times as hard as they make out so they're trying to make out that this is simple and it's not it's it's a real problem um so yeah you've lost your green screen there for a minute yeah I'm yeah I'm, I'm talking to you i'm talking to you through the camera <laughs> And, so uh, uh, this is my presentation. So if I go across to uh, present and do a share screen again and share window. All righty. That should come up. 
There, oh, there we go. And we've got a uh, we've got a share screen. And so if I play that. Bingo. OK, so, yeah, this is all about energy in a way, climate and energy. So I thought this um, <laughs> this image would be a good uh, blend between climate and energy. <laughs> um, and uh, is, this one's entitled Climate and Energy. I, I can hear a lot of uh, noise on your microphone. Um, Climate and Energy Misinformation by myself, Ralph Alice again. Um, but I think this is being very deliberately badly taught and explained. So I think this is more climate and energy disinformation. Um, and that's what we're going to look at. So again, this is explaining that I have some experience in this because I wrote this paper. So we won't look at that. We'll just head on very quickly. Um, this was the same graph that we looked at before, so we'll run through this very quickly. Um, just saying that um, temperature and CO2 may be correlated, but they seem to be correlated in the opposite direction because high CO2 causes cooling and low CO2 causes warming. And this would not happen if CO2 was a strong greenhouse gas. So this is, the, in, in a way, the foundation of my net zero opposition because if co2 is not causal then we're just wasting our time and wasting our money of course so that has a big effect on when we're talking about net zero so climate misinformation and i think this is um important because if you look at the mainstream media you're only getting one side of the story and it's a very biased viewpoint it's a very cherry-picked viewpoint as well um, so I think it's climate disinformation from the media and how did this all start well it started with this of course you'll remember this you were talking about Al Gore just a minute ago and his famous hockey stick graph that was taken from M Michael Mann uh, he's a climate scientist and this is the one he displayed on that big uh, screen and you can remember he had a cherry picker to go up and show how much it had warmed uh, in recent times. Now, so on the bottom here, we can see it's got a thousand years of data, proxy data for a thousand years, and you can see the temperature just bubbles along, and then suddenly it shoots up in the 20th century. So um, how was this formed? Well, this was created by tree rings, and I don't think that tree rings are a very good proxy for uh, temperature. I mean, if you think about it, what will make a tree grow and what will make it stop growing? Well, I mean, there's lots of things. There's canopy cover, there's pests, there's nutrients. There is water, of course, at the amount of precipitation and maybe temperature. But in my view, trees respond much more to precipitation than to temperature. If you have a very, very hot, dry summer, the trees are not going to grow very well because they don't have enough moisture. So what are we recording when we're looking at tree rings for temperature? Are we recording precipitation, not temperature? Anyway, <clears throat> the other problem within tree rings is when they're coring a tree to get you know, the tree rings, they have a tube which they core the tree, which is only about a centimeter wide. So that's the, the thickness of the core that you pull out. Well, it matters a lot where you put that core into the tree because we can see here that we've got very thick, wide tree rings here on the uh, sort of 10 o'clock position, meaning that it was very warm in this era when these tree rings were growing. But if we trace those tree rings round to the right, the same tree rings, we find they're very small. So it was hot, but cold at the same time, depending on where you take the cores in this particular tree. If you had taken the core from the 10 o'clock position, you'd say it's warm. 
if you took the core from the sort of two o'clock position, you would say, oh, it's freezing. So what was the temperature? Same down here. We have big tree rings, and if you trace it around, we find the tree rings are small. It was both hot and cold in the same tree. Um, so do we rely on tree rings? Are they a reliable proxy for temperature? I don't think so. Anyway, so here's, here is that um, hockey stick draft, graph. How did they produce it? Well, this email will probably tell us. Uh, so this is a, an email from Phil Jones to Ray Bradley, Michael Mann, and Keith Briffer. Uh, these are all climate scientists. This is from the um, uh, ClimateGate emails. You remember that scandal with ClimateGate? Mm. Uh, so this is going back 23 years here. This is 1999. Yeah, that was wasn't that 2010? Yeah, tw yeah, something like that. 2006, I think they came out or something of that nature. Um, anyway, there was all these emails were dropped of their conversations. And it was known as Climate Gate because there were some very odd conversations they were having. And this mm. is one of those odd ones. So it just says, I've completed Mike's nature trick. Now, Mike is Professor Michael Mann, this guy. Uh, nature is the... Um, scientific journal nature and it says i've just completed mike's nature trick of adding in the real temperatures temperatures to each series for the last 20 years from 1981 onwards and from 1961 for keith's keith briffer's data to hide the decline so what was the um trick and what was the decline they were hiding? Well, we can see that from Keith Briffer's data. So this is his data. And this, again, is tree ring data. This is for 600 years here of tree ring data. And you can see that the temperature bubbles along, doing not much at all for hundreds of years until we get to the mid-20th century. And the temperature goes down. It declines. This is the decline they were hiding, that the tree ring data did not go up in the 20th century. It went down. And this is known as the um, divergence problem. The divergence problem says that tree rings record temperature perfectly for hundreds of years until 1950, and then they stop. I kid you not, that's what they say. And if you believe that, well, I've got a bridge to sell you. And so what do you do if you have a divergence problem, if you have a decline that you want to hide? Well, it's simple. What you do is you rub out the end of the graph and you stitch in the thermometer data and lo and behold, you've got a hockey stick. <laughs> and that's exactly what they did. They spliced two different graphs together. And that's why it's a different color on the end. So this is, I would, I, I would say that's fraud, really, because that was never explained initially. Someone found out this after a couple of years later in one of the um, uh, IPCC reports, and they found that it was a splice between two different data sets. Uh, and this was the whole basis for the global warming scare. And it was fraudulent. It was a splice between two different um, data sets. Because if, if tree rings don't reflect temperature in the 20th century, how on earth can we rely on them to give us temperature uh, in the past, for hundreds of years in the past? Uh, the whole thing was based on a nonsense. Um, I, I would call this totally unscientific. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It really oh, is. It God. really is interesting. Wow. Um, and they've continued with this ever since. So I think the whole foundation of climate science is based on disinformation. It's based on cherry picking and a fraud. And we see this in all of these diagrams I will show here. So um, this is from UK Weather Maps from the BBC, the most trustworthy news organization in the world. Well, it was up until about 2005. 
and now it's the most untrustworthy um, media organization in the world. Anyway, so this is their weather maps. And the question is, which is the warmer weather? Well, it's the one on the left, of course. So what's the difference? Well, the one on the left is from 15 years ago when we had proper weather maps. The one on the right, <laughs> this is the uh, climate alarmism <laughs> version of a weather map. Now, the BBC said this was to, um, uh, to make the maps easier to see for people. Uh, yeah, no, this is part of the climate alarmism. Um, it was much better when they had the maps on the left. We could see what was going on. Um, and we have the same with tornadoes, um, maybe of interest to viewers in America, of course. So what's happening to tornadoes in America? Well, we all know they're getting worse, of course, because we're told that all the time. They're getting stronger. You know, uh, towns are being wiped out all over America. So let's look at the data. And the data here comes from NOAA. This is the Storm Prediction Center at NOAA. NOAA is... Um, uh, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, I think they're called. And this is of strong tornadoes, F3 to F5. We've got 70 years of data here. And as you can see, the strong tornadoes have been decreasing for 70 years. And of course, that's not the impression they give. So if people didn't know that, if uh, viewers didn't know that, why did they not know that? Why is this not front page news in the newspapers. Um, same with um, cyclones, uh, so hurricanes and uh, typhoons. What's happening to those? Well, we all know what the problem is. You know, they're getting worse. They're getting more frequent. They're wiping out coastal communities all over the world, causing absolute mayhem. This is a sure sign of global warming and climate change. So let's look at the data. This is from uh, Professor uh, Ryan Mao, Dr. Ryan Mao, actually. And he does the satellite data on cyclone frequency. And here we have just over 40 years of data. And as we can see, the uh, all hurricanes on the top has been slightly decreasing for 40 years. And the major hurricanes on the bottom have been steady. No change in 40 years. <laughs> which is a little bit different to what the media want to try and portray. So again, where is the climate alarmism in this data? And we can take this further back because there is proxy data. We can look at for uh, cyclones in the past. Here it is. This is by Chan et al. This was released only in 2022. So this is quite recent. Uh, cyclone numbers around the world uh, over 170 years. So as you can see, uh, numbers of cyclones went up from 1850 to 1900, and they have been decreasing mm. ever since. So we've had 120 years of decreasing uh, tropical cyclones. And again, where is the climate alarmism for which we need net zero? Where is the climate alarmism in this data? It's just, it doesn't exist. Um, same with uh, snow extent in the Northern Hemisphere. We had a very famous climate scientist over in Britain from the CR CRU. His name was um, Professor Viner, David Viner. And uh, he said, our children will not know what snow is <laughs> because of global warming. So let's look at the data. This comes from uh, Rutgers University. They hold the data over there. This is called the Rutgers Snow Lab. Uh, this is winter northern hemisphere snow extent. And they've got data here for 50 years. That's not too bad, over 50 years. And as you can see, winter uh, northern hemisphere snow has been well, slightly increasing, not much change over 50 years. So there's a, a different um, result to what they were expecting. A truism in this is that no prediction by a climate scientist has ever come true. So why do we depend on these people? It's, it's like the old Fauci argument that we've just been discussing. Why do we 
depend on these oracles within science when everything they say has been wrong and continues to be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, polar temperatures and ice sheets. This one's a, a mixed bag, this one. Uh, what's been happening to polar temperatures? Well, we all know that the, the poles are melting. The seas are rising. We're all going to drown in like 20 years or something, apparently. Um, so let's look at temperatures. So this uh, data comes from uh, uh, UAH, which is the uh, University of Alabama Huntsville. They control the satellite data that comes in from NASA uh, and they control the polar regions. So the top graph is Antarctic, the bottom one is, sorry, the top one is Arctic, the bottom one is Antarctic, and we've got 40 years of data. It's 40 years of data because that's all of the satellite record we've got. We can't really go back any further for the polar regions. So uh, top one then, temperatures have been increasing uh, by about one degree over 40 years. Well, you might say that's a problem. But that doesn't necessarily mean it was CO2, of course, as we saw in the previous talk. It might be something to do with Chinese industrial dust uh, on the ice sheets. <clears throat> I'll, I'll pick out some uh, images of those ice sheets later when we finish that, actually, because uh, <laughs> some of those are quite astounding. But anyway, we'll look at that later. Um, bottom one is Antarctic temperature, and there's been no change. No change in 40 years. So all of these um, uh, dire warnings of the Antarctic melting, yeah, the temperature hasn't changed in 40 years. So let's look at uh, sea ice. Uh, this comes from, what's this from? This is NSIDC, which is the National Snow and Ice Data Center in America. These are all the established icons of you know data, uh, weather and climate data. This is not made up data. This comes from the uh, recognized sources for all of these um, uh, these data sets. So uh, the blue one is Arctic sea ice, and that has been going down, but has been rising actually very slightly. Um, so it went down quite considerably over 40 years. It reduced by about 20, 20 yeah, about 20 percent it's reduced. Uh, but now has started rising a little bit. Uh, this is to um, September, so fairly recent data. And um, the red is Antarctic, and the sea ice there was increasing for 35 years up until 2017, when there was a big storm down in the uh, Antarctic, and it broke up a lot of the ice, and then it reduced. But, you know, whatever you think about sea ice, there is no correlation here whatsoever with CO2. So what's the causing agent for this discrepancy between, you know, why is there is this difference between the northern hemisphere um, and the southern hemisphere? They seem, seem to be heading in opposite directions, these, these two graphs. So that's interesting. I'll leave that with you for further thought. And we must, oh, I've got some pictures here. Um, yeah, this is the Arctic. We were talking about the problems with um, Chinese industrial dust on the Arctic and how that might be affecting uh, warming and melting and climate. Well, this is the Arctic. It's not exactly pristine, mm. <laughs> you might say. And it, you can imagine that this dark ice will be absorbing much more sunlight than bright white ice and this could be one of the uh, causal agents that is causing melting again this is the arctic um yeah not what you expect if you go up into the arctic and so is this the arctic <laughs> yeah and this is what the dark snow project was trying to record um, and they had one year of funding and then their funding was cut and they weren't allowed to go and do it again. Uh, because you're not allowed to challenge CO2. If you're not exploring CO2 as an option, well, no, you get your funding cut and, and uh, yeah, you can kiss goodbye to your career. Mm. <laughs> oh, and here's a quote from 
the dear old BBC, the most trustworthy organization in the world. Yeah, well, it used to be. Polar bears. What's happening to polar bear numbers? Well, this is from the BBC. They said polar bears will be wiped out by the end of the century unless more is done to tackle climate change. A study predicts. Yeah, this is pure disinformation because the BBC must have known the real data because this is 2020, they were saying this. The real data has been out ever since 2018. I think Sue Crockford put her, her data out. So let's look at the real data. This is polar bear numbers by uh, Dr. Susan Crockford um, in her report in 2019, it was. There we go. And we've got 60 years of data here. And as you can see, number of polar bears has been increasing for 60 years. Not only increasing, they have quadrupled in 60 years. So where is the extinction of polar bears in this data? This is why the BBC is guilty of disinformation, because they must have known about this graph. It's been out for long enough. Um, <clears throat> but they still choose to give you the alarmist perspective on climate. Yeah, disinformation. Um, well, food production, yes, because I saw lots of... Um, alarmist claims about this global warm is, is is going to wipe out food production and there's going to be widespread famines everywhere because all of agriculture is going to i don't know burn die i don't know something's going to happen to it and we're all going to starve well let's look at world food production and this data comes from united nations <laughs> but do we trust their data or not i don't know uh, United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. And this is uh, 20 years of data. And so we've got the red one is cereals. The yellow is sugar. That's gone down a little bit, but then we're not eating as much sugar now as we used to. Uh, vegetables and oil crops. The blue ones are fruit and root tubers, et cetera, et cetera. All of them have been increasing. I mean, this is supposed to be the the 20 years of real climate change when we're supposed to be really warming and food production has gone up <laughs> continuously. Why has it gone up? Well, it's mostly gone up, of course, because of uh, extra CO2. And do I have that in the next diagram? Oh, no. Okay, so most of that has gone up because of CO2 fertilization. They call it the greening of the planet. Um, I wonder if I can go back to the previous one. Yeah. Um, so extra CO2, CO2 is plant food. It promotes the growth of plants in general and agriculture in particular. And I've seen estimates that uh, extra CO2 in the atmosphere has increased agricultural production by 15%. Mm. through CO2 fertilization. The same as uh, greenhouse growers will uh, put extra CO2 into their greenhouses in order to boost production. And mm. that is partly why um, production has gone up. Also, many plants, especially in the boreal uh, nations, respond to warmer temperatures. Obviously, warmer temperatures are much better for plants. So, yeah, agriculture production has been increasing for 20 years. So where is the famine uh, in this data? It, it simply doesn't exist. It, it's, it's pure alarmism. Mm. So then if you mention this in, in polite society, they will say, <clears throat> and you viewers and listeners will have heard this on numerous occasions, 97% of climate scientists agree with anthropogenic global warming. No, 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 no. And as if, you know, um, what do they call it? Uh, uh, an appeal to authority. 97% of climate scientists have said so, so shut up. Don't argue. Um, that's basically what they're trying to say. But, of course, where did this come from? It came from this paper by uh, John Cook et al., 2013, there have been follow-up papers that have the same errors in them. 
because this is not what the actual data said. So how did he do his uh, research? Well, they got 12,000 climate papers, uh, of which 66% expressed no opinion on climate. So they threw those out of the window. Um, and of the remainder, 3% of those papers rejected global warming. Huh. Ergo, you might say, therefore, 97% of papers with an opinion supported global warming. That's where the 97% came from. Huh. But if you dig further into the data, and of course, they didn't append the data onto their um, onto their paper. It had to be got through freedom of information requests. But anyway, once the data came out, we could see that only 24% of these uh, remaining papers, um, no, only 24% of the papers supported global warming. Now, that's so broad <clears throat> that myself as a climate realist would have to be a 24 percenter because there has been some warming. We don't quite know what's causing it, and we don't quite know the magnitude of it, but there has been some warming. And therefore, I would have to tick the 24% box. You see how broad this is. Mm. Uh, further down the data, only 8% endorsed anthropogenic global warming, that it was mankind's fault. Huh. And only half a percent of the papers it uh, supported the IPCC version of anthropogenic global warming. So it wasn't 97%, um, it was half a percent of scientists. Shoot. A completely different story. And of course, all climate scientists are paid to agree with anthropogenic global warming. He that pays the piper calls the tune. And if you don't go along with that tune, you end up like these climate scientists who were dismissed from their jobs because they did not agree with anthropogenic global warming. Uh, that's the problem. Again, we see there's no freedom of thought, no freedom of research, and no freedom of publication within the climate science community. But I would broaden that out to much of science as well because they're all suffering from the same problem. Um, when I look at this from my historical, with my historical hat on, uh, because obviously I research history quite a lot, I would say there was an awful lot to say for the old Victorian um, policy of having uh, gentlemen scientists, people who were independently wealthy, who were interested in science or nature, who used to do independent science, because they are not beholden to any mm -hmm. government or to any uh, institution, and they can look at everything with a critical eye. That doesn't happen in a lot of science no nowadays, because you're so bound to your institution because your job depends on it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's a problem with all of science, really. Mm -hmm. So we come to net zero. Um, now, this is going on in America, I'm pretty sure, exactly the same as it is over here. Uh, I've heard some of your politicians uh, talking about it. Um, in Britain, they want, um, uh, they want electric, um, <clears throat> sorry, they want all of the electrical system to be uh, renewable by 2035. And they want all energy to be renewable by 2050. So they want all of energy, that's all of transport, uh, heating, which is it's, it's the biggest sector we have. It's like 40% of our energy usage is used for heating during the winter and industry. I wonder um, why they want... uh, sorry, go ahead. I say I wonder why they want that, because wouldn't that make it easy if they took everyone's personal car away and made them take... Uh... Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, take the public transportation, then they have digital currency. And if they do anything they don't like, they can just take their money right out of the bank. Oh, yes. Yeah, very easy to control. Um, in some senses, it might be an idea. We'll go into this, but uh, we need to transition away from fossil fuels. But 
not by 2050, because we're never going to manage it by 2050. Um, maybe in 100 years or 200 years, you want to transition away, but not over the time span they've got, and they're underestimating the costs. So this is my declaration. Uh, I support responsible net zero. The trouble is they're not being responsible about it. Why? Uh, not because CO2 is a problem. I think that's a total red herring. Uh, it's because we will run out of fossil fuels. Uh, us before America. You're in a slightly better position over there. Britain hit, hit peak coal. So we've already had peak fossil fuels. In 1913 was our peak coal output. Uh, we hit peak oil in 1999 and we hit peak gas in 2002. Uh, we're long past having any fossil fuels in Britain, which means we're going to be dependent on the rest of the world for our energy input, which is not a good idea, as Russia and Ukraine have just proven um, when Germany ran out of gas. Um, yeah, so it's a problem for us. Regards CO2, however, we need more CO2, not less. So this is going back to having that um, quick look at CO2. We've done this before, so I'll run through this very quickly. The unspoken truth is that CO2 is plant food. So the difference between these plants is the amount of CO2 they get. Um, so CO2 is the most essential gas in the atmosphere. We are at 400 parts per million at that point, and the plants are doing fine. But during the last ice age, it came down to 190 parts per million, and the plants were beginning to die. So low CO2 equals plant death, which equals CO2 deserts. And funnily enough, it's worth noting that during the Jurassic era, CO2 was 2,500 parts per million, which is mm. six times more than now. And the biosphere was fine. In fact, you could say the large size of dinosaurs was in part due to increase CO2. Huh. More CO2 equals bigger plants, equals bigger carnivores, equals bigger carnivores. Did I say that right? Um, more CO2 means bigger plants, means bigger herbivores, means bigger carnivores is what I meant to say. Um, so the large size of dinosaurs was in part due to extra CO2. So don't let any uneducated teenagers tell you that CO2 is bad for the biosphere. Mm. Quite clearly, it's the opposite. More CO2 is good for the biosphere. Yeah. It means everything can grow more strongly. Yeah, my greenhouse um, have CO2 uh, generators. Yeah, yeah, lots of greenhouses, they have CO2 generators. Or during the winter in um, uh, the Netherlands, which is a very big greenhouse, there's just greenhouses everywhere in the Netherlands. Uh, during the winter, they get the exhaust from the gas heaters and they pump the exhaust <laughs> into the greenhouse because the exhaust is mainly CO2, of course, and that <laughs> promotes um, CO2 growth. Uh, CO2 growth? Uh, plant growth. Um, well, <clears throat> so, yeah, more CO2 is good for the biosphere. Yeah, so definitely. this brings us on to the energy policy and to net zero. Now, this is tailored for Britain, of course, but exactly the same is true of America. Uh, so it's not an energy policy. I say that our government has got an energy fantasy. And if AOC in America is anything to go by, you have an energy fantasy in America as well. <laughs> yeah, she wants us to drive Flintstone, Fred Flintstone cars. <laughs> yeah, you can have Fred yeah, Flintstone cars, yeah. <laughs> Except she won't have one. She will have something with a big V8 in the front of No doubt. Um, the Queen Moron. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Um, yeah, she had a, a Tesla, didn't she? she? She thought that was very green to have a Tesla. But then uh, Musk bought uh, Twitter and she wanted to sell her Tesla immediately. Yeah, boy. Uh, yeah. You talk about a woman who couldn't rub two nickels together to make a dime, right? Used to be a bartender. And <laughs> yes. nobody, right. even tipped, yeah, nobody even tipped her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, yeah they, uh, they gave her money to go away. Huh. And suddenly she's a millionaire. Yes. Yeah, I'm sure. And her boyfriend said, what do I got to do to get rid of you? <laughs> <laughs> Go into the White House. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so this is UK electrical generation. Now our electrical generation system is probably uh, probably a tenth the size of the American one, something like that. I mean, it's much smaller, of course. Um, so electrical generation by type. Uh, we're mainly gas, uh, and by gas we mean methane. We, we don't mean petrol. Um, gas to us means methane. Uh, so we're mainly methane powered. Uh, and then wind and solar has now become bigger and bigger. And so renewables now are 39% of electrical generation. Hmm. And you might say, hooray. Um, but maybe not hooray in a way, because this blue sector on the uh, bottom left there, this is um, Drax the Destroyer. <laughs> Drax the Destroyer was our largest power station in the UK. It's four gigawatts, which is pretty big for a power station. And they've turned it into a wood burning stove because it's not allowed to burn coal anymore. So now it's burning wood. So now it's chopping down all of the trees in America. So if you're wondering where all your forests are going, we're chopping them down, making them into wood pellets. We're shipping them across the Atlantic and we're burning them in the Drax power station. Is that a good idea? Oh, I'm not quite sure. And it's, this is a lot as well. I mean, last year, I think they burnt 20 million tons of trees, which we purchased mostly from America. Um, so, yeah, is that a good idea? Oh, I'm not quite sure. Um, the other problem is UK fossil fuels are only one fortieth of what they are using in China. So let's have a look at the Chinese um, pie chart. Electrical generation by type. And as you can see, it's mostly black because <laughs> it's mostly coal fired um, power generation over there. Oh. Um, and so, yeah, if you look in the bottom left hand corner, UK is 16 gigawatts. That's the standard unit of output that we use for electricity. And um, China is 615 gigawatts is what they're using on average Good Lord. of fossil fuels, you know? So, I mean, they've got a huge amount. So if you want to put our pie chart against China, yeah, that's our pie chart to the same scale. <laughs> so whatever we do in Britain, we can bankrupt ourselves completely. We can go back to the Stone Age and it will make no difference to the output of CO2. Right. Yeah, if you think do. CO2 is a problem. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, while America uh, will have a bigger pie chart than Britain, it's still dwarfed by the size of the Chinese uh, generation. They are the biggest uh, generator by fossil fuels in the world. Um, and of course, the other problem is, what are they doing about this? You know, we're trying to reduce our fossil fuels like crazy in Britain. Mm -hmm. What is China doing about it? Nothing. Are they reducing? Yeah, more than nothing. Um, they're increasing. So China is building 50 gigawatts of coal just last year. Oh, so that's like you... uh, four. Sorry, say again. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to not comment. Uh, a minute. Uh, yeah. Sometimes when you interject, the, the, um, it gets lost in transmission, so I, I don't always hear. Um, so, yeah, just last year, they built four times the amount of um, fossil fuels that Britain is trying to get, that Britain is using and trying to get rid of. And so they are increasing the amount of fossil fuels that they're using. Um, so, yeah, whatever we're doing in the West is completely irrelevant if India and China are not going to come along with mm -hmm. us and do the same. Um, but there's another problem here, and that is that electrical generation is not energy. It's only a small proportion of energy. So uh, this is the same graph we've seen before. Uh, UK electric generation by type. And the bit I want you to look at is the top here, the red one, uh, and well, I suppose the yellow one as well, and see what happens to those when we go across to total energy. 
So here's total energy. Yeah, suddenly now oil and gas becomes much bigger. Gas, of course, being methane. Um, why is it bigger? Well, because total energy includes transport, heating, domestic heating and office heating and everything else, and, and uh, industry. Because all of those together are like uh, four times the amount of um, electricity that we're actually using at present. So that means that our renewables comes down to only 16%. So rather than being a large proportion of our energy, it's actually quite a small proportion of our energy. Um, <clears throat> So power generation needs to increase by 300 or 400 percent if we're going to go all electric, which is what our government wants to do by 2050. So they want to go all electric and all renewable by 2050. So we need to increase power generation by 400 hmm. percent, four times as many power stations um, of whatever variety they're going to choose. And so where are these new power stations being built? I ask this question because power stations, you know, they're normally about 15, 20 years in the planning, especially if you're going to build nuclear. Those planning um, plans and planning permission need to be in place now if they want to generate that electricity by 2050. <laughs> and of course, nothing's being, doing, being done about this at all. Um, so we're basically going to run out of energy by the time we get to sort of like 2030, 2035, we're going to start running out of energy because they're quite happily closing down all of our coal fired power stations and they've got nothing to replace it with, mm. um, which is fairly standard for them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sorry, any dare. questions? You know, I'm just saying, how dare uh, these common folks use up all the resources of the elite? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're supposed to be preserved for the elite. It's true, yes. Only they can fly to their lovely conferences down in uh, in Switzerland, you know. I fit, but if you fit, I figured it out. I mean, who's killing, like, uh, uh, all the Asians are being pushed in front of the subways and all in New York? You know what that is, right? No, I've not heard of that one. The, well, they've had a lot of uh, of hate crimes against Asians, right? Oh, yes, in, I've in heard New of York. those. Yes. Yeah. Those are those black white supremacists that are doing that <laughs> right yes yeah those those i mean it's uh the whole problem is uh white supremacy i mean that's the whole problem and, <laughs> and yeah, we uh, have the same in the uk i mean i find it very suspicious sometimes that people are giving the same talking points and excuses throughout the world but yeah we have the same talking points in britain that whatever goes wrong in Britain, it's always down to white supremacy. Yeah, that's it, become, it, it, that's it, it, become it, the standard refrain. It, it's it's yeah, either white supremacy or um, hate crimes against uh, protected classes of people or whatever they're called. Um, mm. Or if you speak against anything, uh, freedom of speech is one of the most important things in the world, but um, it, it doesn't, uh, you know, I mean, People go up and they look you up on the internet and they find out if you said anything, you know, it's a, like in your whole life, um, that might then then they judge you on that, which is just absolutely ridiculous. But uh, then you have this here; they're not going to be able to do this. They're going to force people into smart cities and ration electricity is what they're trying to do. They're trying to create this this crisis, like you said. They're shutting down plants that they yeah. can keep going that aren't hurting anything. Um, they're just making up reasons to do it in order to what enslave you into 15 minute cities. Smart I think, cities. That, well, uh, yeah, I think we, we have two sides to, to this coin. We, we have some people who are in on the agenda and are trying to change everything um, because they, they regard humanity as, as uh, a disease and they want to reduce humanity. And then the other side of the coin is we have, politicians who are so stupid that they don't even they can't examine any of these uh, um, policies to see if they make sense or not and so they go along with it because they don't want to be cancelled they've they've got no idea if it's true or not 
And so they just vote yes every time because they're the sort of useful idiots. And so that's two sides of the same problem. We don't have any politicians with backbone and the intelligence to stand up against this. Well, you probably don't know about this. We had a famous politician um, in, in Britain who was um, standing up against some of the COVID nonsense and some of the problems we've got with uh, excess deaths, which you've got in America as well. I've seen the data. And in Britain, more people have died since COVID ended than died during COVID. Oh. So we have this problem with excess deaths, huge numbers. I think it's something is running at like 40,000 excess deaths a year at present. Oh. And nobody knows why they're happening. So this brave politician who's been trying to um, highlight this, he stood up in Parliament in order to give a scientific, because he is a scientist himself, I think he was a medical doctor or something. Anyway, he is a scientist. He stood up to give the, the facts and the data from the reputable authorities on excess deaths. And all of the other politicians in the parliament walked out. Huh. They wouldn't even stay there to, um, to actually hear what he had to say. It's, Why uh, do they, what is their alternative preferred explanation, if any? Why would they find that, uh, what are they they're, they're trying to, They're trying to say it's long COVID, that it was caused by COVID itself. They're trying to say it's the backlog uh, of medical procedures that weren't done because, of course, the hospitals were closed down for two years sort of thing. They're trying to blame it on anything else they possibly can. But the data does not back that up because this is an explosion of deaths in the mid to young age groups, mainly men. Oh. So COVID obviously affects old people and the ill and the infirm, you know, people from 65 and above. These excess deaths are caused mainly in young men between sort of 20 and sort of 45. So it's a completely different demographic. So it can't be, um, it can't be long COVID. And it's unlikely that these young, youngish, generally fittish people are suddenly suffering from uh, problems with hospitals being closed for two years because they've never been into hospital in their lives anyway. So it's highly unlikely that any of their ex explanations are correct. And therefore, the correct or the possibly correct interpretation is this is something to do with the medical intervention that we had. And there's lots of information to back that up. Uh, if, if people haven't heard of him, I would certainly recommend uh, Dr. Campbell on YouTube does a lot of very good videos on this. He's a doctor himself, and he has been giving the facts, nothing more, nothing less, oh. for two years now. And uh, yes, yeah, some of the facts he gives is um, very interesting. So yes. that's the problem we have with politics at present is nobody has the backbone to stand up against what the agenda is. Nobody in the media will point out the errors, as we've seen with the uh, weather data we've just looked at, that they're all ignoring the alternative weather data. And yeah. now they're all um, ignoring the problems with net zero. It's, it, it, it's really obvious, though. I mean, it, it's an agenda. It's not a um, the agenda 21, agenda 2030. I mean, if you go and you read, uh, <laughs> if we could put it, I wish I could put it up on the screen. I don't know how to do that. If you go to agenda 30 and look at what they want, they want everyone to get an, an, an inoculations of, of almost 60 different inoculations with their, uh, with their uh, uh, shots. And, uh, you know, and that's all with that, that, that same nonsense um, that they're using which I don't want to get into that, but um, then they want people just to comply. And uh, then, then they want to grow meat in the laboratory and they want you to eat these, this mm. meat that's grown in the laboratory by Bill Gates. Um, this isn't conspiracy theories. These are real. I mean, it, it, it's really weird. It's kind of like um, 
they won't believe it until it's in their living room and yeah. um uh, yeah, and they want to give the police more powers um and it, <clears throat> they want to declare they, they they're doing their best to declare this climate as a national crisis emergency that gives them more powers like covid did. yes mm. and they're going to do it unless people stand up against it that's the well, I, I wouldn't mind I wouldn't mind concern about the um, climate or concern about fossil fuels or concern about um, medical interventions if they were telling the truth. <laughs> but of course, the problem is they're not. They're not telling the truth about climate. They're not talk telling the truth about COVID or uh, ab about energy. And therefore, we cannot make up our minds we cannot come to an opinion ourselves because everything they're giving us at present is based on misinformation and disinformation and that's the real problem they don't even have the data to back up the things they're trying to do um well, i mean even with um uh with medical interventions you know in terms of vaccines i've had dozens of vaccines because they will try and denigrate <laughs> you and say oh you're an anti-vaxxer mm. no i've had dozens of them but in the past most of these vaccines were very effective yeah but of course the one they brought out recently was not effective and seems to have lots of side effects and that is a problem and now they've obviously tried to cover it all up whereas if you look at the data and again i'd recommend um, dr campbell's videos he has been pointing out all of the adverse effects and the alternative data for all of the research and development and uh, application of these medical interventions and everything he's bringing out is the total opposite of what the media has been telling us so we're yes. being gaslighted continually and that that is a real problem that even sensible people because you know i i talk to sensible people who you know friends and family and whatever <laughs> who watch the mainstream media therefore are not well informed and they're aghast mm. they can't comprehend that you're giving them data that is totally opposite to what they've been told mm. uh, and so yes it's very difficult for us to bring people along and tell them the truth when they've been given misinformation for years and years and years it's very mm. difficult to persuade people that they've been lied to by those they trust by mm. scientists by yeah. david attenborough i have a talk on david attenborough as well <laughs> oh, oh. who's been uh, david attenborough he's uh, the most famous ecologist uh, um uh in britain and he was a trusted um figure within britain he was the most trusted person on the um, BBC but for the last five ten years he's been giving nothing but disinformation um, so yeah you can't trust a word he says anymore so yeah, that's they, an interesting story they ban David Ike everywhere have you ever listened to him yeah I don't listen to Ike very much because he goes off on a tangent too much um, he, he spoils it by going off on tangents which were unbelievable if you stuck with the more believable stuff i think you would have more followers the um, lizard people yeah all that sort of stuff <laughs> i mean he just he, he ruins it you know so you know he might be 50 percent correct but he loses that 50 percent by um talking yeah, about lizards and other <laughs> yeah i mean i like other. david um i mean i like david i talked to him before on uh info wars when he was up there um that he lost me because he said anyone with an O negative blood type is a lizard person, right? <laughs> yeah. And I have to, you know, and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm O negative, <laughs> you know, uh, and I'm not a lizard person. So, um, you know, but yeah. I, I think he, <laughs> he changed his tune. Is, is that, uh, is that why that you've one. got that big long tongue? <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like I'm a lizard. You know, it, I'm going to transform into one right here. Now, if I could, I would because I'd get more views. And uh, yeah, you know, I, yeah, if I could transfer it to it, but but if I could do it somehow, I have a green screen behind me. Uh, Y'all saw that, yeah. I mean, because uh, this little studio I have in my living room, and uh, yeah, you've got a snake on that, yeah. I saw that, hey, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah, I've got I've got a snake. Um, hold on a second, let's see. Um, I've got a really nice one right here. Um, let's see if you can see it. See him? We've lost you. Oh, you see him right there. 
Okay, uh, do you see the snake right here? There you go. Yeah, I've got the mic back. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I got a little yeah, snake right here. Um, um, there it is. It came into focus. There he is. It's a candle, but it's really cool. Um, yeah. Uh, Bob's wife, Carol, sent it to me. It's really cool. Um, it's uh, I, I like to have like two or three, so I actually light the candle, but it's really cool. I mean, it keeps me company, man. I, start, I named him Nah Nahushtin. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, uh, but no, I mean, I've been studying this for since, uh, man, shit in the eighties and, uh, the nineties, I was actually, uh, I got involved in this. It's going to sound weird. I was out fishing on a boat one day and these Greenpeace people came around throwing rocks at the boat and I'm like, they're in the water to scare the fish away. Well, that really irritated me. So I followed him into the Sunrise Marina off Kickatan Road in Hampton, Virginia. We went in there real quick so we knew where they came out of. And we beat the living hell out of them when they got off the boat. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, we, we beat the hell out of them. Um, unmercifully, we're, we were, I was in the military and there was like eight of us and we're all rangers and we're waiting for those guys. We're like, oh, throw rocks. We're out here paying to be on a boat and you're throwing rocks at our boat. Well, they, needless to say, they never threw rocks at our boat again, but um, they gained. I managed to pick a flyer up from these psychopaths that uh, were trying to save the fish. And it said on there, uh, global warming. And this is the first time I've ever seen that before. So I started investigating it, looking at it. And uh, following it up until now, I was in my 20s, you know, um, early 20s. And now I'm 56. So I've been following it every year. Uh, but Mari Strong, Al Gore, or the, you know, Al, we call him the Goracle. Right, the Goracle. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he looks in the crystal ball. Um, and uh, his hockey stick, you know, like you said, it was really good there when you added that. That was, you know, because, uh, but I've been following all these knuckleheads, right? Um, and, you know, reading their stuff and studying the climate. And then John Coleman of the Weather Channel. Um, you, you, are you familiar with him, Ralph? uh is, is he what the one that fakes strong winds you know ron coleman he went against the climate change uh narrative um and he has a video on youtube it's uh, under john coleman um he owned the weather channel he used to own the okay, weather channel yeah, it's a bit of an american thing yes yeah he but he's he's really good and uh so i started studying it it's um it just none of it makes sense. The only thing, the only part about it, you make sense. They don't. They're, they're not making any sense. Um, carbon. Okay. You know, um, I have a T-shirt. I was gonna put. I wish I had it on right now. It says, "You're the carbon they want to get rid of." Yeah. <laughs> you know, and um, you know, and then you have people that use the word climate denier, right? Uh, well, uh, because they got a lot of mileage in the Holocaust denier um, stuff no. with that re, with the revisionist nonsense um which uh you know which is like bringing up uh, oh, it's uh, painfulness <clears throat> it's deliberately pejorative isn't it yeah yes mm -hmm. uh, shall i just uh, uh finish this off just very oh quickly? yes sir yes yeah. sir um so we were looking up <clears throat> um the amount of energy that britain needs and again america will have the same problems that we have but there's another problem that nobody is talking about in the uk um, and that's backup because if we get rid of uh, elect, uh, rid of gas, methane, which we're currently using to back up renewables for when they're not working, then we need some sort of storage. So how much storage will we need? We can calculate that. UK generation is about 40 gigawatts. And uh, this is a graph of UK generation. So this is how much energy we're using. This is for December 2021. So this is winter, uh, which. Huh. It should pop up. Yeah, I see it on the bottom row there. I know I can't. I'm trying to get it up there. Um, let me see if I can remove it and add it again. Let's see what we can do. OK, hold on. I think that. Uh, I can add it that way. Hold on. I guess not. All right. Let's see. I'm trying my best. I'm terrible at this. Sorry. There we go. I, I cannot pull this up there for whatever reason. 
it, it, uh, are you there, Ralph? I, it's what it is, is Ralph froze. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, let me see if I can get him back in there. Hold on. I will wait till he comes. Oh, he's he's completely out. Oh, wow. He'll be back in a second, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, it's just that that's what happened. His video froze because uh, because of that. But talking about, listen, here at the here at this channel, we do not um, violate any YouTube standards or any of that stuff like that. And um, you have to do the research yourself. We can't do, you know, like that and, mm -hmm. and just investigate everything. Um, we can't say what Ralph said is true. We can't say what uh, we don't know. I'm not a scientist. Um, Dr. Price is not a scientist. He right. plays one on TV, though. <laughs> but he's not, <laughs> he's not a scientist. And uh, we just try to have a good time. Oh, wow. We got Ralph back, the climate realist. Excellent. Hey, okay. There we go. What are you there? Yeah, my internet dropped out for some reason. So I'm back with you. So uh, let's go back to where I was before. So uh, let's do a presentation, share screen, window. Okay. I'm looking for probably uh, this one, I think. Um, so I'm just deciding which window I need. It's that one. So if I share that one. All right, let's see if we can get it up. Boom. There it mm. is. Mm -hmm. Good. Right, well. uh, oh, okay. Yes. Now I need to play it as well. Otherwise it won't play. So let's, let's play it. Right. <clears throat> so um, shall I start again from the beginning of this page? Because I don't know when I dropped out. Mm, yeah, no problem. Okay. So um, the, the other problem they're not talking about with UK energy and American energy as well. Um, is backup storage, because if you get rid of the fossil fuels, which they want to do in, in the UK, of course, um, at present, fossil fuels are backing up renewables. But if you get rid of the uh, fossil fuels, then you need some other storage system uh, for when the sun is not shining and the wind is not blowing. So how much do we need for Britain? Well, we can calculate that. Our normal energy usage is 40 gigawatts. Um, this is a graph of energy usage in the UK, and uh, this is for December 2021. So this is obviously winter. Uh, we've got gas is in purple. Uh, solar is in yellow. And note, there is no solar. <laughs> for us up in the north, we're 52 degrees north up to 54 degrees in Britain. Um, you cannot have solar. It just doesn't work in the winter. And you can see that because there is no generation at all during December 2021 for solar. So we cannot rely on solar power. Uh, the blue is wind. That's what we're using most of. But the problem is you can see a big gap here. So uh, here's the gap. There we go, where there's been no wind and no solar as well. So we had a six day wind outage and some of these wind outages are quite big. The largest I saw was three weeks, so 21 days um, without a lot of renewables. And of course, if that happens when we have no gas, no methane gas to back us up, then we're going to need some sort of storage. Um, so we need, a, I think, at least 10 days of stored backup. Uh, in order to keep the lights on for when there's no wind and solar. Uh, how much energy is that? We can calculate that. Uh, so we need 40 gigawatts for 24 hours a day for 10 days is 4,800 gigawatt hours of energy. Don't worry about the units. Just have a look at the magnitude. Um, but that's not all because, remember, electricity at present in Britain is only 25% of total energy. So if we're going to get rid, if we, if we want um, uh, transport and heating and industry to be all electric, we're going to need 
four times as much, which is 19,000 gigawatt hours of energy stored in backup. And at present, we only have 10. <laughs> so we need 19,000 gigawatt hours. And at present in Britain, we only have 10 gigawatt hours. Um, you can see the problem that we need an awful lot more um, storage. What sort of storage? Well, the obvious one is pumped water storage, where they pump water up a hill and then let it flow back down again. And you're basically using the water as a big battery, basically. Hmm. Um, now, our biggest one at present is the Norwig, uh, which is in Wales. And um, the problem with Dinorwick is because it's in a national park, they made them build it underground. So they actually built it inside a mountain. They hollowed out the inside of a mountain and built the power station there, which made it hugely expensive, as you can imagine. And the problem is that uh, we need something like 600 Dinorwigs <laughs> in order to back up the energy for the UK. Um, okay, that's a real problem because Dinorwig was the most expensive power station ever built in Britain. And we need 600 of those. That's just not going to work. Anyway, even if we could do it, we can cost it out because its current cost, if we built it now, is 1.7 billion. This is in pounds. So in dollars, that would be about 2.2 um, .2 billion dollars or something like that. Uh, maybe a bit more, $2.5 billion. So the total cost of storage, 1,000 billion pounds. A nice round trillion. Uh, we can check those costs with Corey Glass. That's a new one they're building up in Scotland. This is the upper pond. This is where they pump the water up into this pond and then let it flow back down again so they can use it as a big battery. Um, and the costings from Corey Glass is, again, it's about 1,000 billion in pounds. So call it something like uh, at least 1,500 billion in dollars. That's just for the UK, you know. Times that by five or ten if you want to build that in America uh, because you use a lot more energy than we do, of course. Uh, so the government is not serious about Britain converting to electric generation using renewable energy unless they address the energy storage problem because we cannot have renewables without stored energy. Otherwise, the lights will go out for weeks at a time mm. when there is no wind or solar and mm. they're not addressing this problem. Now, they've known about this for many years because this... Um, uh, Professor McKay was the former government science advisor, and he wrote this book, which is Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. Uh, it's 10 years old now, but the data is still pretty good in it. And he could not solve this problem with the um, stored energy. So he came up with five of these uh, plans for how to go renewable in Britain. And these are his five plans. Now, they all have a large block of energy and then lots of little ones below. And um, these are three of the, I think, the most viable ones. So these are energy costings for 60% of our energy, not all of our energy, um, just for 60% of our energy using offshore wind and this is the problem with going net zero is they've underestimated all of these um, problems and the costings so we need a hundred horn c3 wind farms now horn c3 is the largest wind farm in the world which is over in the north sea and that's being built at present and that's going to cost eight we need 100 of those to power the nation. Well, not even power the nation, to power 60% of the nation. And that's going to cost about $850 billion. Uh, but they wear out after 25 years. So you've got to do it all again. That's another $850 billion. Uh, And then you need the pump storage backup, which is, as we've seen, about $1,000 So the total is about 2000 
700 billion, uh, around 3 trillion. So in, in dollar terms, about 4.5 trillion. And you might multiply that by 5 or 10 to get the equivalent in America. Uh, so you might be talking as much as 30 trillion in America. <laughs> And this is part of the problem. They've underestimated this. Um, a report to Parliament recently came out and said we can do all of this. We can go all renewable um, for 410 million, they said. No, it's not. <laughs> it's just not going to work. Um, they're underestimating their costs, I think, to lead politicians down the garden path making them think this is possible, easily doable, and then they'll get 25% down this garden path and suddenly find it's almost impossible to go net zero by 2050. It's just not going to work. The second one he came out with, this is from Professor McKay, who's the um, former government science advisor. You know, this is a guy that should know his stuff. <clears throat> and he said, let's build some solar in the Sahara. He recognized that solar power doesn't work in the UK. There's no point having solar power here because it doesn't work in the winter. So we'll stick the solar panels in the Sahara. Yeah, but this is a bit of a, a fantasy um, because the costings just don't work. We would need 3,900 Rorton airfields. Now, Rorton Airfield is the biggest solar plant we've got in the UK. It's not as big as some of the ones you have in America, but it's still fairly big. We would need 3,900 of those at a cost of at least 320 billion. Uh, and that's at today's costs. Remember, if everybody piles into solar power, then the prices of these um, uh, solar panels will rise. Uh, they only last 25 years, so you've got to replace them. So that's another 320 billion. Now they're down in the Sahara. We have a problem with this because we need to pay rent. It's not our land that they're sticking all these things on. We will need to rent that land. I've costed that over 50 years at 1,500 billion um, to pay the North Africans for their land. Then we've got to pipe it back to the UK. Uh, and these pipes, these, these cables are really, really expensive. I've based this on the Swedlink cable. In Germany, they're building the Swedlink, which goes from northern Germany to southern Germany because they have the same problem. They have to get wind power from the north down to the south of Germany. And that's costing them uh, about $8 billion just for one cable. Uh, they've had a lot of problems with that. It's one of these new HVDC cables. Um, but we would need 340 of those cables at a cost of 3,100 billion. Uh, mm. And those cables have got to go all the way back through Spain and France. <laughs> I mean, these are long cables. You're going to lose 15% of the energy just in the cable itself because it's such a long cable. Um, <clears throat> and you still need pump storage back up because the sun doesn't shine always in the Sahara. You know, they have nighttime over there as well. So so you would need some sort of stored backup for the energy. So the total cost is around six billion pounds, something like nine billion dollars. Um, just fantasy land. It's never going to happen. Yeah. It's, it's, it's never going to work. The other thing he came up with is uh, nuclear power. Um, we would need, because we're building two at present. We're one of the few in Europe, and I'm glad we are doing it. We're building two power stations, nuclear power stations at present. So we've got good costings on how much they cost. The trouble is that we would need 30 of these power stations to power Britain. And these power stations, they take 15 stroke 20 years to build. There's no way in the world that we're going to build 30 uh, large nuclear power stations in the next 25 years. It's just not possible. And even if we could, the cost will be about 600 billion. That's based on the costings for Sizewell C, which is that they're building at present. Um, fuel, 
Uh, that's a bit of a variable. I've seen various costings, but I, I'm looking at about 500 billion for the fuel over 50 years and for the reprocessing. Uh, I got that from an American site that gave the costings on um, reprocessing fuel for the American nuclear power stations. Um, and maintenance is quite high on these power stations. They call that another 500 billion over 50 years. So, you know, you've got 50 years of usage. Gives you a total of about 1,620 billion. Uh, that's wrong, isn't it? It should be, yeah, 1,600 uh, billion. Again, very costly, and it's not going to happen in the next 25 years because physically we cannot build that number of uh, power stations over 25 years. This is why I say the, the whole of their net zero energy policy is an energy fantasy. So any of these politicians, same in America, if they're promoting this idea that you can go net zero by 2050, it's not going to happen. And so we need some opposition to these politicians so that they don't let the lights go out because their mm. policy doesn't work. The other problem for us, not so much from America, because you're still much more industrial than we are, is they've promised us that this is the Green New Deal, that this will be the green new jobs and industries for the future. This is how they are selling it to the British people, that all of this uh, expenditure in infrastructure will benefit the economy. But if you look at offshore wind, well, that's being the Hornsea 3 um, wind farm is being built by a Danish company using what? Swedish turbines, using German, um, uh, what are they building? They're building the uh, generators and the gearbox and Japanese cabling. So where's the benefit to Britain in any of that? And uh, in a way, America will still have this problem. A lot of this equipment will end up coming from China or Japan or something like that. So, you know, if people are talking about Green New Deal and Green New Jobs, you will have to ask where these um, products are going to come from. Uh, solar power, well, you can bet your bottom dollar that all the solar panels will come from China uh, and the cabling. At present, all of these HVDC uh, cables, they come from Germany and Japan. So they're not going to come from Britain. Mm. Uh, and I don't think America produces them either. You'll have to check up on that. And if we're looking at nuclear now, I'm really upset by this because Britain was at the forefront of nuclear power. We built some of the very first nuclear power stations way back in the 50s and 60s. And we had advanced gas-cooled power stations, not like in America where you have these pressurized water ones. We had gas cool uh, nuclear reactors. So what are we doing for nuclear power nowadays, you know, in, in the 21st century? Well, it's being built by China and France, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> so our two new um, uh, nuclear power stations are being built by China and France, and we're not building any of it. So that's a real shame. Oh, my God. Yeah, not very good. And while we're on the topic of uh, nuclear power, let's look at uh, safety. Um, so CO2 and safety. The first graph is CO2. So this is levelized CO2 emissions. Uh, because if CO2 is a problem, I don't believe it is a problem. But anyway, if people believe that CO2 is a problem, what's causing the CO2? Well, at the top, of course, we have coal. Yeah, that's obvious, isn't it? Then natural gas, um, coal with carbon capture and all of that sort of business. Right down at the bottom, we have wind and nuclear. So if people are worried about CO2, which I'm not particularly, uh, then nuclear is a good option. What about safety? Because nuclear power gets a bad rap, of course. Um, what is the most safe? Well, the worst one at the top here is brown coal. <laughs> mm. Coal-fired power stations are actually not very safe. Coal and then oil, then biomass, then gas. And way down at the bottom, we have wind, nuclear, and solar. 
So they are the safest options if we want uh, safe power. Now, nuclear gets a bad rap, but if you look at some of these accidents, it's had three main accidents, of course. But at Three Mile Island, nobody died. At uh, Fukushima, only one person died of uh, radiation poisoning. <laughs> um, so again, relatively safe. Um, and even uh, in the Ukrainian uh, nuclear power station, if you look at some of the estimates, they say, oh, thousands and thousands of people died. No, that they are estimates. They are models of who might die from radiation uh. poisoning. Um, the Russians did a, a relatively good, and people think it's a, a, a relatively honest um, uh, estimate of who actually died during that uh, emergency, and only 36 people died of radiation poisoning. Hmm. Um, and there was something like a thousand people ended up with thyroid pro problems um, in the immediate aftermath of that uh, explosion they had. So nuclear power is relatively safe. I mean, nothing is perfectly safe. Energy is dangerous. You know, dense amounts of energy, however you're going to put them together, are dangerous. Uh, that's just, we've got to accept that. Um, but nuclear power has got a bad reputation that it doesn't really deserve. And of course, modern nuclear power stations are much better than the ones built in the 50s and 60s. Um, so nuclear problems, nuclear power, yep, yeah, it does have some problems. We might have a look at those. Some of these problems might not be obvious, but anyway, let's have a look at them. Let's have a look at uranium to start with. Um, so it's low efficiency because we're only burning a half a percent of the fuel we put in. So uh, this is mainly due to the failure of fast breeder reactors. We don't have in, in the West, we don't have any fast breeders anymore. Fast breeders can actually breed their own uh, new fuel uh, to alleviate the low efficiency problem. So the only people with fast breeders now are China, India, and Russia. <laughs> um, they've all had problems with them, but the West, we closed all of ours down. So that gives us a problem that we only have about 200 years of easy uranium available if everybody goes for nuclear power. So nuclear power is not exactly the panacea because we're going to run out of nuclear power as quickly as we're going to run out of fossil fuels. Um, you need reprocessing plants, of course. You need storage for these long half-life waste products. You know, there are some items there that need 30,000 years of storage before they become safe. That's always been a problem with nuclear power. Um, and the possibility of meltdowns, that's always been a problem. We've had three already. So what's the alternative? The alternative is thorium power. And here he is, thorium hey. cell. <laughs> so uh, thorium is just another nuclear fuel, but we've not been using it. So what's the advantages with thorium? Well, it's high efficiency. It's a natural breeder reactor. So all of the um, fuel gets used. So yeah, natural breeder reactor. We've got loads. I've seen estimates of a million years of easy thorium available. So it's it's relatively abundant and available. Uh, we've got 200 years of thorium already sitting in waste dumps. Uh, we don't use it anymore. So it's a byproduct of um, mining at present for um, what do they call them? The rare earth minerals mm. and it's just a waste product so at present it goes into storage luckily it's not radioactive in its raw state so they just put it into storage we used to use it a long time ago <clears throat> we used to use it for those filaments for gas lamps those mm. white filaments all of the good ones were made of thorium because it has a very very high melting point but we don't use them anymore it's not um well we don't have filament lamps anyway <laughs> <laughs> That's all a long time ago. Um, you cannot make nuclear bombs with it. I've heard various interpretations of this, but um, there are elements of, of um, high gamma radiation in some of the uh, refining. And so it's very difficult to make nuclear bombs from it. That's why thorium power was dropped 
in the first place because of obviously in the 50s and 60s, 60s the, the main point of having uranium power is that people wanted to generate uh, a bit of plutonium for nuclear bombs and that was difficult with thorium and so thorium got um, cast off to one side uh, there's no separate reprocessing plants required there's no long half life waste products most of the waste products are only 200 or 300 year waste products so it's much easier to deal with and you can build naturally stable cores that cannot melt down so there are lots of advantages so in summary then co2 is the most essential gas in the atmosphere uh, co2 is not a very powerful greenhouse gas we've seen that from my um, uh, peer review uh, climate paper that co2 is not the primary feedback agent climate change is not as bad as advertised we've seen that with the tornado data and the typhoon uh, the uh, tropical cyclone data um, it's all been sort of um, exaggerated you might say most renewable energy needs stored backup you cannot run renewables without stored backup uh, so mandating electric vehicles and electric heating without generating capacity is utterly ridiculous uh, you need the generating capacity there before we go electric otherwise your electric vehicle is going to be sitting at the side of the road with nothing mm -hmm. to charge it mm. um, however alternative energy supplies are required because we will run out of fossil fuels fossil fuels are a limited resource a finite resource now that might not be for 100 years 200 years even more but at some point we're going to have to transition away from fossil fuels because they are a limited resource so what are we going to go for I think a high percentage of nuclear power is required. Remember, France already has, uh, I think they're running 80% of their system on nuclear power. Wow. And they have much, much, their energy prices in France are half of what we're paying in Britain. Mm. And so they have run a fully nuclear electrical system for 40 years. Largely, of course, because France had no fossil fuels, they have really no natural coal and gas and anything like that. So they were forced down this road, but it's been very successful and it's been very safe. <clears throat> and I think we should um, emulate the French. And I don't think I've ever said that before, but never mind. <laughs> um, I think on this occasion, the French went down the right road. Oh. <clears throat> Uranium is a limited resource much like fossil fuels but thorium power is a good alternative but there is no investment america made a thorium reactor back in the 1960s but they did nothing with it it was closed down and it was not followed up so there are no thorium reactors at present so our government is not serious about keeping the lights on and maintaining our wealth and prosperity <clears throat> because all of their ideas for net zero don't make sense they're complete fantasy mm. and that is my end of my little wow. talk in the bottom yeah the bottom line in this is don't panic because <clears throat> we're not going to run out of uh, energy and we're not going to have a climate emergency in seven years as an uneducated teenager told us and we're not going to have any of those emergencies in 12 years like one of your uneducated uh, right. members of congress <laughs> did, did i just hear you mention greta doomberg yeah that one greta the gremlin yeah yeah, um, the <laughs> yeah. she is the, i mean it, it is really a religion i mean you know um how dare you robert and robert and myself we, we in, in in engage ourselves in the history of religion but this really is a religion you know oh yeah it, it has its right. high priests, you know, the Al Gores of this world. It has its um, ineffable God, the unseeable and un unknowable CO2. Um, uh -oh. it, it has its hair shirt indulgences where you've got to pay money um, for your sins. You're committing and it has its, blasphemy. It's, yeah, it's mm. child saint as well. Yes. It has its Greta the Gremlin. It's, it's got all of the facets, you know, of a religion.
Especially the date setting doom cries. Uh, yes. You ever heard of the Jehovah's Witnesses? I mean, that's just. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, they've, they've had we used to have these people years. walking around uh, London, I'm sure you did in, in uh, your capital cities as well, back in the 50s and 60s. And they used to have sandwich boards on them, mm. which is, you know, a couple of wooden boards back and front with big messages on it. And they used to say, the end is nigh, you know, mm. because yeah, oh, yeah. I had a God is going to end the world, you know. It's the same yeah. thing. I had a T-shirt that said, Jesus is coming, hide the porn. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, up at Gordon Conwell Seminary, where I was uh, for a year and a half, uh, they uh, I had to give them credit for uh, a registration drive for a retreat or something. And they had this guy wearing sackcloth coming into the cafeteria while we're eating. He's saying, it's the last day. It's the last <laughs> day. And then somebody stands with, no, no, it's just the last day to register. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of space. The, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, what, it, what it boils down to is, I mean, uh, I like cars, muscle cars, uh, you know, and, you know, and to, to hand it over like Big Daddy Don Garlitz, he switched over to some electric car, which is totally doesn't even get any thrills. Um, the other day in Nebraska, what they have like twenty million dollars worth of solar panels that were knocked out yes. in ten minutes by uh, a by, by hailstorm, um, <laughs> you know, and yeah, one hundred fifty mile an hour winds and a hailstorm took out uh, millions and millions of dollars worth of solar panels. I mean, you should you should see it; it's just junk. And oh, um, well, I mean, and then now it's toxic shit, all stuff all over the ground um, oh, from yes. the solar panels. It's really wonderful stuff. Um, then every here, here's the crazy thing. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine in China a couple of years ago. Uh, he, they were selling, uh, solar panels in China are really cheap. I mean, you could probably get one for like two bucks, man, American dollars or something. Right. But by the time they get here, the government puts tariffs and taxes on them and makes them at least a hundred bucks a piece. Right. And they're like, well, we really want you to go green, but we got to make money off of it. Oh, boy. You know, um, it's it's ridiculous. I mean, I have solar panels on my house, um, you know, batteries, backups, the whole nine yards, right? And that's uh, you know, I use it to power what you're what I'm doing right now. So I am green. This computer's powered, and this live stream is powered by uh, solar panels, right? And the battery mm -hmm. backups. Um, all my electronic equipment is because I don't like paying an electricity company money. It doesn't because I don't give a shit about the uh, you know, this 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 thing here, but. We have people over here. Let's put their questions up. See what they say. Let's just yeah, say. Hello I'm gonna to have to leave you at the moment. I've got to uh, get a little rest and so on before oh. uh, six o'clock when we have yet another oh. show. Okay, not mm -hmm. a problem. We got. Yeah, well, it's good, this good is, to see you, Bob. Again, you too, and thank you so much for this. It's amazingly interesting, though depressing. It's fascinating. <laughs> oh, it's incredible. Fun. My oh, esteem yeah. for you has mounted up yet further. So, thanks yes. again. Oh, yeah, it's, it's I mean, all good I, think, I am stuff. so glad he's on the show today. I tell oh, you, that, yeah. that's uh, that's awesome. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, it's uh, we got Christopher Cully. I guess he says, Hey, right? Okay. Let's see, get rid of that. Let's see, Mandy, let's see. I saw her up here a second ago. Mandy Morehall says, Climate change is real and humans are accelerating it. Laugh out loud, cry more. Okay, that was <laughs> cynicism, sarcasm, right? Here's, oh, speaking against climate change is considered heresy by the Church of Climate Change. No, no, oh, no. Yes. It's the Church of the Truly Warped. That would be a good <laughs> thing to call them right now. Um, we got oh, Tetra. yes, they have their Spanish Inquisition, of course. And That's they right. They use them quite regularly. <laughs> yes, sir. Tetrarch, Tritarch. Yes, um, but you know they're asked they're asked the questions and bring up the what about isms of carbon pollution and putting crap into the air. Well, I don't know. I mean, go ahead with that one. That one's uh well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, no one on this side of the uh, aisle is, is pro putting crap in the air. You know, we want, we're all environmentalists. We want to have as, as little pollution as possible. But the question is, do you consider CO2 to be a pollutant? 
You see, the most stupid thing ever in America was when the EPA declared that CO2 was a pollutant. That's yeah. like declaring oxygen as a pollutant for humans. You know, it's the most essential gas in the atmosphere. Everything will die if we don't have CO2. So there's no way in the world that you can uh, pronounce CO2 as a, a pollutant. And that made a bit of a scare story because people said, oh, you know, um, CO2 is a poison. And then you had to point out that your exhaled breath has 40,000 parts per million. Mm. You know, if you're scared of 400 parts per million, if you go into a theater full of people, the concentration of CO2 in that theater will be about 2,000 ppm or maybe 2,500 parts per million. That's normal for indoors in a crowded location. So let's not get the idea that CO2 is a poison. It doesn't become a poison until you're at very, very high levels. Sure. That's that's very good. In my greenhouse, I'm going there and it's 25, well, it's 2,000. When I'm growing, I grow cannabis, right? Um, marijuana, as to some people, um, for medicinal purposes for other people. And, uh, you know, and I keep the uh, grow room at 1,500 parts per million all the time. I mean, that's in flower. I go to 2,000. And I'm walking in and out of there, and I'm in there for hours, and I feel fine. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, of course, yeah, you I mean, would, it, yeah. it doesn't bother it's, me. It's normal. Yeah, it doesn't. It, if you can stand the smell of that weed, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole thing. Yeah, Try that'll to, probably give you more problems than the CO2. That's for sure. Oh, I know. It's it's <laughs> a a new Tritark says a new political orthodoxy is being forged, and it makes Orwellian ideas like like a picnic by comparison. We got far more dangerous minds with a lot of power and money at play here. I, mean, I agree with that. Yeah, and again, we, we, we have to agree with that. And the easiest proof for that is that all, certainly of the Western nations, are following the same tune, all in lockstep together. You know, why should Britain and America and Australia and New Zealand and most of the European countries all be following the same agenda if this was not being controlled by some sort of higher power. Surely you would have some dissenters, you know, Australia saying, no, we're not having any of this mm. or something like that. Yeah. But no, of course, oh, well. everybody is in lockstep. That's right. That's right. And uh, let's see here. He says, Tritark also says, Fauci is an archon. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're right about well, that. Well, he has guy. got a lot of things wrong. That's that's for sure. Uh, yep. And yet people still follow him. Yeah. You know? Yeah, they, they actually have, uh, let's see, I'll go to the next one. This is uh, Sugar Puff. They will use the mayors to implement the global agenda, including uh, climate. You need to look up ICLEE. It's called ICLEE, I-C-L-E-E. -E. They're giving local money for the last 20 years, or over 25 years, to your local agent, your local governments in America here. I live in... Uh, near Blackstone and they give them tons of money um, to support uh, their, their garbage, uh, their sustainability. I, you know, the word sustainability, Obama said that word over a hundred thousand times while he was in office. <laughs> yes. Right. I mean, it's just, I, I mean, it just, it gets to the point of like uh, say, say sustainability again and I'm going to slap the hell out of you. Okay. You know, on TV. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's what it is. Let's see. Go ahead. Sugar Puff, David Curtin said the deposit for mayoral candidates will be prohibitively large. I didn't know that. Well, I hear in America that a lot of your mayoral candidates are being sponsored by the um, the man that shall not be named, beginning with S. Isn't he behind a lot of these um, candidates? John Soros. Mm. <laughs> George. So I hear that there's a lot of politicians being sponsored by him, local politicians, not uh, congressional or senat senatorial, but local politicians. He's funding them uh, well, in America quite a lot. Yeah, he is. And he funds uh, these places where they let criminals go. Um, yes. These, yeah, they, they don't, they do not. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, they, there was a guy in Grand Central Station the other day, a black fella. And he uh, start, he was stabbed two white girls, teenage girls, right? Screaming out really loud, the death to all white people, right? He wanted to kill every white person he saw. 
Well, he'd been released about 15 times and he was an arch criminal, but you don't hear that on the mainstream media because uh, they have an agenda. If it was a white guy who did it or an Asian guy who did it, then they would be, uh, it would be, they would never shut up. I mean, it would be just constant. It's just so ridiculous, right? Um, yeah, we, sugar we, puff. We, we have the same in Europe. We have um, um, the standard refrain from the mainstream media is if there's an, an attack, they will say, oh, they, they had um, um, mental health problems. Yeah. That, that's the standard refrain. Uh, yeah, mental yeah. health problems means they were I Islamists. That, well, that's what yeah, it means, yeah. basically. <clears throat> it's like this. They, they, they'll blame climate change. It's ridiculous. I mean, you know, these um, these uh, these bottom surgery people. I mean, I'm sorry. They, they're out there. They're hey, it's 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 just incredible nonsense. I mean, you know, and and you have to look at the news every day. Well, I don't. I don't because if I turn it on, it's like uh, I don't know. I mean, it's a litmus test for stupidity. I mean, you know. But um, here we go. Sugar puff. Did anyone hear about this? Is, Freight 747 carrying lithium batteries getting burned out of the sky last year in Dubai. Funny how that wasn't big news. Yeah, um, that was more than last year. I think that was because, you know, I'm in the industry. I, I tend to follow these things. I <laughs> seem to remember that about eight or ten years ago. But, yeah, it was a very famous, well, in, in the industry, it was quite famous. It didn't appear uh, in the mainstream media. But, yes, they had a, a lithium fire. And, mm. uh, yeah, it, it was a real problem. I think the whole thing, yeah, if I remember correctly, the whole thing crashed. Yeah, it was, but if it had been anything else, if, um, if it was uh white supremacy, it'd be, you know, whatever, or they could make it into it, it'd be all over the news. I mean, you know, and I mean, <laughs> a white guy set fire, he was smoking a cigarette near the plane. It, <laughs> they can't report bad news linking to the green industry. There you go. Try to talk. Well, that's what we're just talking about. Good observation. Um, that's right. They can't because, uh, you know, people ask questions. Uh, the questions aren't answered because the questions are not politically correct or of their ignorant agenda, which we're trying to expose a little bit here today, like the agenda 2030. Um, hold on. Let's see. Let's see. Go ahead. This one's, Ah, man, I swear, what did I just do? Okay, I clicked it. Craftomatic, I'm finally here, but more errands to run. I will be listening sporadically. <laughs> Great information. So, Ralph, outstanding work, Lisa. All right. He does do outstanding work. And uh, we're glad to have him on the show. I mean, at, at any time. I mean, you know, that's we got enlightenment with Ellis. Uh, we we'll also have a, a call-in show Saturday at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time in the United States for Ralph. And a lot of people are going to watch this after it's aired. And we want to make sure you tune in that day. And we're going to have a phone number you can call and talk directly to Ralph. Or some some people out there, if you send it early, um, we might be able to put you on the, on, on screen with, with Ella, send you a link and let you come in. Um, but we have to know who you are first. Um, but Ralph, uh, you're in what part of England again? Uh, Chester sort of way, northwest. Oh, Okay. <laughs> Okay, and uh, the the policies over there. I mean, I, we've been watching TV here, uh, and the only thing it shows is uh, these stupid smart cities. Are you near any of these smart cities? Or yeah, I've that policy has gone around all of Britain. Um, now the only ones to start implementing it are places like Oxford at present and Colchester, but I've been invited to give talks to all of these councillors based upon, um, well, the talk I just gave about energy policy and so on, and also to counter the training that they've been given. They've got this training program that's going on in a lot of these councils, mm. and I've been picking apart their training program and pointing out all of the errors. So I've been giving lectures to councillors about that. Because at present, they're being gaslighted, of course, because these councillors don't know anything about energy or climate. They've got to rely on these um, people. And um, the government, I don't know how they've managed to do this, but the government is sort of employing this uh, charity who has put together this um, training program, which I think has just been taken from Google searches, basically. 
no one in this charity seems to have any qualifications as as a climate scientist or an energy um, technologist. <clears throat> so they've put together this training program, which is absolute load of rubbish. So mm. I've been countering this uh, training program and pointing out to people that everything we've been talking about, the climate is not that bad, the energy policy does not work. And of course, that's caused a bit of a stir. Lots of supporters, of course, who who want to hear this information and lots of consternation from the councillors because suddenly they're being told something that's completely different to the um, government information they're being given. Wow. <clears throat> so I hope that that will go a bit more viral and I'll get more engagement with that. Uh, no doubt that will provide some more opposition as well, but you know that goes with the uh, territory. Um, and we'll see what happens on that. But I've given this talk several times and I've got several more booked up for 2024. Hmm. And hopefully we'll manage to push back against this a little bit because I'm just worried that, <clears throat> as I was saying in that um, talk, the government is making it appear as though going net zero is so simple. It's easy. It's very cheap. We can do it tomorrow. And I'm pointing out that actually, no, it's, it's very difficult. It's going to take a long time and it's going to cost an awful lot of money. So, yeah. you know, let's do this from a position of realism that we understand the risks. Um, and they should know these risks. because We've already done this with HS2 in Britain. Um, yeah. in, in Britain, who was the founder of the rail industry was in Britain. Uh, we started the rail industry with the rocket, which was the first ever railway locomotive. And so we had one of the first railway uh, networks. But it got a bit old and a bit tired. It was all made way before the Victorian era. And then Europe started making all of these high speeds. Mm. So France and Spain, they've got all these high speed trains. And so people kept saying, oh, why can't Britain have a high speed? Well, you've got the same problem in America. You've got no high speeds at all. They said, oh, well, we can have high speeds. You know, it's cheap. It's easy. We can build this uh, line from London to Birmingham to Manchester. Cost us about, you know, 10, 10 billion pounds. It's easy. Mm. Well, they got halfway down this route. And suddenly now it's being costed out at 120 billion. You know, costs of multiplied tenfold in the meantime suddenly they've decided that it's impossible and they're going to halve it they're not going to complete it it's only going to go to birmingham and the whole thing is going to be a complete waste of space mm. because no one's going to use it it's going to go from london to birmingham and it's going to save you about 20 minutes of time and cost you twice as much as the old trains so wow. what's the point and I think you have the same problem in America with that uh, West Coast train they're making from, I think it, it goes from out of LA, doesn't it? Goes northwards or something. Yeah. And that's, that's had important. the same problem. They costed it at some stupid cheap price. They started the project and now it's got bogged down and prices have gone through the roof. And they're yeah, going to yeah. do exactly the same with net zero. They're going to promise you the earth. It's going to be cheap. It's going to be easy. And suddenly it's going to cost you trillions and trillions of dollars. It It's the same thing that they're promising the coal miners in West Virginia and Ohio. Um, they're saying that they're going to get jobs making solar panels. Um, and that was, I mean, you can't do that. I mean, it that's uh, ridiculous. But they, they keep doing these well, you, things. You they? could, but... They're not because they're going to be a quarter of the price from China. So they're going to import them from China. Yes. <clears throat> if if they mandated it that you'd have to uh, get through them from America, <clears throat> you could do that. Mm. But that just puts up the price of your net zero by fourfold because now yeah. you've got to pay American wages, not slave wages to uh, Chinese guys. So suddenly, mm. again, your costs are going to go through the roof. And yeah, they've yeah. not costed that in. Yeah, with this 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 um this nonsense here in America, all our fast food chains are closing down, Burger King and and Taco Bells. I mean, I know that they're not good to eat and everything, and it's supposedly not good for you, whatever, but because the government and these liberals or these uh, lefties, um, they came in there and said that they need a living wage of fifteen, twenty dollars an hour to work at a uh 
So what that's doing is driving up the prices of everything else. Inflation. It's, uh, mm. you know, you go to McDonald's, you get a burger and fries for five bucks, right? Now you go there and it's $15. Mm. So, I mean, you're paying for all this uh, inclusion, intersexuality, or what, intersectionality and all this nonsense um, out of your pocket. And people are getting tired of it, I think, and they're getting tired of the climate stuff too. I mean, it's uh, oh, you know, and energy costs for us have gone double at least. Yes, uh, in yeah. order mainly in order to pay for renewables. They keep saying renewables are cheap, but why then are they being subsidised? Right. We we have a direct subsidy that goes to renewables through the um, REGO system, renewable mm. obligation certificates. But then they get extra um, bonuses because they get priority on any energy generation. So if there's plenty of wind and they can generate, all of the gas-fired and coal-fired power stations have to close down Yeah, because the renewables get um, priority. So how can you run a cheap gas-fired power station if you're being forced to close down all the time? Um, mm. That's That's the problem. That's why... Uh, they say <clears throat> that renewables are becoming cheap, but only because they're getting preferential treatment and only because they are not funding their own storage system. Mm. As I said before, you cannot run renewables without storage. And what they're doing is relying on gas power in order to back up their uh, renewables because they have no storage. If they had to pay for storage, you immediately double the price minimum. Mm. And they're not paying for the storage. Right. It just waste. It, it's have you ever thought about running from parliament or something over there? Yeah. Um, I might be uh, forced to do something like that. I'm not much of a <laughs> parliamentarian because um, I generate too much friction. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> apart from that, I'd have the right ideas. I think I would do better as a policy advisor uh, rather than being up there and being a politician where you have to, um, you know, rub hands and grease people's palms and all the rest of it. Oh, yeah. um, but I'm good at giving them the right information that they need to know in order to make policy, which they don't have at present. Well, the, the only good thing I can see, and this is maybe, and I'm not very versed in this or knowledgeable, but the King of England, right now, Prince Charles, well, King Charles, right? Um, he's always been, uh, he was in 1992 at the Earth Summit uh, off off the coast, and he supports all of this Agenda mm. 21, Agenda 20, you know, 30 stuff. And uh, mm. I, I, mean, I, would, I would consider him um, extremely dangerous to freedom. Oh, yes, know, I mean, he is. Yeah, and, um, you know, I, I don't he, think... He is, that, he is the worst possible. Um, but he's been like this for... 40 years so he's not going to change he's always been a woke idiot i mean he's an <laughs> idiot because he had very well he is uh he had very poor education um did very badly at school and he's always been on the ultra green side the ultra mm -hmm. woke side um he agrees with everything the wef says when uh wef said that you will own nothing and be happy he was saying that as well, as though he mm. agrees with all of that. When COVID came along, he was saying, yes, you must all lock down and never come out of your house. Well, the thank you, King, King Charles, but you're in a house with a 600-acre garden. It's all right for you, chum, but for us, you know, in a one-bedroom flat or something in the middle of Birmingham, it's not very nice, thank you. Mm -mm. Um, so the guy's completely out of touch. He's completely woke. He's got no idea what he's talking about. And he's the very worst person you could possibly have in charge of Britain at this moment. Um, mm. We need someone, because the whole point of having a monarchy, you don't have a monarchy, you have a presidency instead. But the whole point of having a president or a monarchy is you have someone to challenge parliament. Mm. So the president is someone who can stand above Congress, well, as does the Senate as well, and look at what they're doing and tell them if they're being stupid. Um, we have the same with a monarchy. So the prime minister every week has to go to the monarch 
and bow before them to show that they are inferior, as it were, to the monarchy, that they are not supreme themselves, because some of these presidents and some of these prime ministers tend to think they are gods sometimes. So they have to bow before the monarch and give a report on what they're doing in parliament, mm. which I think is a good system. But it only works if you have a monarch who can criticize what the parliamentarians are doing. Yeah. And of course, with Charlie Boy, uh, old big ears, he's not going to do that because he's a woke idiot. So, um, yeah. yeah, he needs yeah, the, to go. The, the thing about this, uh, this woke, um, it was originally, I think, uh, an African American term, right? Um, mm. uh, and it became uh, like insane after 2020, you know. Mm. Um, and you know, but people don't see; they can't see the forest for the trees. I mean, they can't see what's going on, and uh, everyone's always like afraid they're going to offend another person, you know. Which um, I'm, I'm still stuck in 1985. Okay, I can't leave there. Um, <laughs> so, so I mean, if I leave there, I go into insane, ter uncharted territory. People say, "Well, you liked it because um, I liked it because no one cared about your color or your race." You know, I wasn't in the military, right? We're all green. We didn't see color, and uh, you know. So, but nowadays, all these people do is uh, tell people how how they've been mistreated, and they're believing it. You know, I mean, they're they're buying into this nonsense, and that's that's scary. Uh, and well, it's th this this is um, social Marxism. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's the standard uh, refrain that we've had from them for the last sixty years or more. Uh, Marxism um, wants to overturn the establishment and establish a one world government, all that sort of stuff. Now, originally, they tried to do it through class, which is what they did in Russia. So they wanted a class revolution to overturn, you know, the um, uh, administration and convert into communism or Marxism. Now, they managed to do that in Russia, but they never managed to do it in the West. They tried in the West for ages and ages. But everywhere in the West, the workers were too rich. Yeah. Mm. Why do you want to rebel and possibly lose anything, everything? when your life is relatively comfortable. So the, the class war that the Marxists were trying to generate in the West never worked. Yeah. And they tried that class war for like 30 stroke 40 years. Yeah. And so it didn't work. So now what they're doing is social warfare. So they're wanting to spread divisions um, within race, especially in America. It's not so much of a problem here, but in America, they want to... Uh, divide people on race, uh, divide them on sexuality, uh, divide them. Um, what else are they trying to divide us on at present? Um, on feminism, I suppose, males versus females and all the rest of it. Yeah, It's a way of dividing the population because the only way you can rule a population is by divide and rule. As long as you can keep them arguing with each other down the bottom and having a revolution, you can use that revolution in order to turn over the establishment and get a yeah. new establishment, which they want as a Marxist or communist one. And they and keep trying exactly to create. what they're trying to do. They keep trying to do it, and they're they're, they're winning. Um, it looks like um, on some some, but hopefully we can overtake them. You know, like that. Um, let's see, sugar puff popped in here. Hold on, let's see. The chemtrail people need to be careful, or we might get taxed for CO two and water vapor. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, that. It, it, who was the idiot? Wasn't it? Um, what's that guy? Uh, Bill Gates wanted to black out the sun, put a bunch of like dirt and stuff up in the atmosphere. I mean, I wonder if the, I hope that never gets off the ground. That is just the stupidest yeah. shit stuff I've ever heard. Yeah, as if, and and the the real problem is that if we haven't got the amount of warming that they keep claiming, this uh -huh. is all based on IPCC predictions. But <clears throat> if you if you read uh, Dr. John Christie from uh, UAH, from uh, University of Alabama, Huntsville, mm -hmm. uh, he is the only um, climate scientist who is looking at the greenhouse effect. Mm. 
just very quickly, the um, the greenhouse effect actually takes place in the atmosphere, in the troposphere at 35,000 foot up at those sort of levels. And it is the warming in the troposphere that warms the ground. So if you're determining what's happening uh, to temperatures, there's no point measuring ground temperatures because they are secondary. Mm. What you need to do is measure the temperature in the atmosphere, in the troposphere. Now, the only climate scientist that's really doing that is Dr. John Christie. Um, and from his calculations, he has determined that the actual warming through greenhouse gases that's going on at present is only 1.1 degrees for a doubling of CO2, which, as he said, is not a problem. It's about a quarter of what the IPCC are saying. Mm. Um, and so what he's saying is that the actual greenhouse warming is only a quarter. Therefore, any other warming is coming through other means. Mm. It's either different feedbacks, not CO2, or you've got a problem with your instrumentation. Mm. And of course, surface in, uh, instrumentation has a lot of problems. A lot of these um, uh, these sites that they use for determining temperature are based in the wrong locations. They're based at airports. They're based uh, in cities where we get urban height, heat island effect. And so I'm not entirely sure that we can trust any of these surface temperature measurements that we get. Um, mm. For instance, in Britain, we've got the CET, which is the Central England Temperature uh, data set, which is the longest in the world. It goes back to about 1650 or something. So we've got hundreds of years of temperature data. <clears throat> but the trouble was it was formed from three uh, measuring sites. Now, one of those sites was at Ringway, which mm. sounds all very nice, but Ringway is Manchester International Airport. So for uh, at least two decades, all that site was doing was measuring the increase in aircraft traffic mm. over the 90s and 2000s. Now they've moved it now to an agricultural college because obviously that temperature gauge was in completely the wrong location. But that, um, that agricultural college they've moved it to has a tropical greenhouse. And so if you get a light northerly wind during the winter, you're getting hot air coming off this uh, tropical greenhouse. So the surface uh, record we've got for temperature is very suspect. Um, mm. And that is what they're basing their ideas of global warming upon. Hmm. And we should not be doing that. We should be taking the measurements from the tropical troposphere. Um and they're not so alarmist, of course. They're they're indicating very little warming. Hmm. It's amazing. I mean, that I I didn't know that at all. I mean, you know, that was informative. I mean, I just thought about hmm. it. It's um, hmm. Let's just see. It means it's that their their basic data they're using is is incorrect. And how can we base a science on incorrect data? I mean, the other problem with their data is <clears throat> it's been homogenized. Yeah. So they take the raw they take the raw data in and then they have to make amendments to it because things have happened in those sites. You know, sites have moved, the instrumentation has changed, all sorts of things have happened. And so uh the various authorities have made um I think they call it USC something, the United States. Anyway, there's an organization in, in America that controls all of these measurement stations but they have to massage the data because you have to make amendments to it to allow for all of these changes oh one of the big changes was the time of observation they changed the time of observation at all of these right. sites and that changed the temperatures so they had to make changes but every change they've made to the temperature data sets has increased its temperature Mm. And there's like 20 of these amendments they've made to the temperature data set. And every single uh, change has increased temperatures. And mm. uh, someone, um, Tony Heller, I think it was, uh, he's got a very good site. He's very good at digging out some of this data. Uh, he's on YouTube and he's on, uh, uh, on X as well. Mm. And he determined that a full 
uh, is it a full one degree or half degree? I think it's a full half of a degree centigrade in warming has been caused by these adjustments. Wow. Not by any temperature change, but just through the massaging of the data. Uh, and that's another problem. So how can you <laughs> trust the data when half of yeah. the warming we've had has been caused by adjustments to the data? It's, that's, you can't. That's, yeah, it's it's uh, highly uncertain. That's crazy. Hold on, we got one here. Nature, natural explorer. Ralph needs to explore into unlimited free energy extracted directly from the Aether Nassam Haramines Unified Physics available at the Renaissance Foundation is where it began, where this begins. I've, I've never heard of that, have you? No, I haven't. And I'm, I'm always wary of any of these things that sound like perpetual motion. Um, yeah. Every, every man and his dog has been inventing, you know, free energy for the last hundred years. And of course, yeah. nobody has managed to. And of course, if you managed to make something of this nature, you would be a trillionaire very, very quickly. Yeah. So I, I, <laughs> I, I don't give them much regard unless you can demonstrate um, with real money and real energy that you can do something. Right. This guy here, Natural Explorer, climate deception is the sorcerer's tool for creating the global problem required, requiring the facade of global one world collectivist govern governance as the only and the one and only solution. Excuse me. Yeah, it, I mean, that's that's quite that's possibly the uh, rationale behind all of this. There are many people and I've spoken to people on the liberal left in Britain who are very attached to this idea of a one world government. Uh, originally, the one world government sprung from the Second World War. And of course, there were a lot of the um, anti-war brigade said, mm. we don't want to have another of these wars, which is not unreasonable, you know. And yeah. they said the easiest way to uh, stop all of these wars is if we have a one world government. And that is what they are uh, pushing towards. And the way what you need for a one world government is one world problems for that government to solve. Mm. Things like world p pandemics and, and world climate change and things of this nature, um, which we will need a world government to oversee. But what they've never explained to me or to anyone else is how you can prevent the one world prime minister or president being Saddam Hussein <laughs> or Stalin or Pol Pot or whoever you want to choose. Who is to stop your one world government being run by a dictator? And that is well, the problem. The whole point of having nations is the same as our governmental systems in America and, and Britain. You like have Star to have Wars. a governmental system that works. Otherwise, your nation breaks apart. And so America based its governmental system on Rome. So it's a Roman system with right. with the um, Congress and with the Senate and with the president who, who is the emperor. Uh, we have a sort of similar system in Britain with we, we have a we have a, a Congress and a Senate. We call them the Parliament and the Lords. It's the same idea as your Senate. And the whole idea, and then we have the king or queen above that, of course, as our sort of um, president. The whole point of this separation of these powers is that one side of government doesn't become too powerful and becomes a dictator. Mm. So if Congress goes mad, then the Senate can say no. And if Senate goes mad, the president can say no, etc. So that's the way we run our governmental systems. Now, the in their one, one world government, there, there doesn't appear to be any way of opposing a dictator taking over the whole of the world. Hmm. And therefore, it's open to abuse. It's open to gen degeneration into a tyranny. Hmm. And that's the problem with a one world government. That's, I agree with you 100%. That's a, um... you see, I mean, if, if China goes mad, as they may well do, because I mean, they're sort of rattling sabers, America might be able to do something about it. If Russia goes mad, as they have done recently, then the West can sort of gang up on Russia and put them back in their silly box. What about, um, 
right vladimir putin um you know you said russia's gone mad right um mm. all right i i know this is gonna sound um kind of from left field um i don't see um vladimir putin has gone wild maybe i'm like in another world or something i'm not sure uh, but i, well, I don't no, I see he, I, he's not i i know what you're gonna say is because he was he was a good uh republican for a long time he was doing the very things that um people on the right want he was opposing all of the uh, woke nonsense and therefore he was a champion of the right and if he had stayed a champion of the right he would be a savior mm -hmm. but for some stupid reason he decided to invade ukraine which didn't do him him any good didn't do us any good didn't do the west any good so from that point of view that decision was utterly stupid he could have retired two years ago just before the invasion as the hero of russia he would have been the greatest um leader president of russia that they had ever had and he's just destroyed that legacy because he's done Russia no favors whatsoever. What about, um, didn't he invade the Ukraine because, in the Donbass because they were killing Russians back in 2014? Well, that was the excuse. I mean, every war needs an excuse, just, just like Israel wanted an excuse to go into Gaza. It's yeah. pretty obvious that Israel knew everything about that, that, proposed attack on them by Hamas and they chose to turn a blind eye because it right. suited them America did the same at Pearl Harbor they knew Pearl Harbor was coming but they turned a blind eye because they needed an excuse to go and uh, beat the shit out of uh, Japan <laughs> and I've no doubt they did the same in Ukraine as well they turned a bit of a blind eye Russia has been angling to take over Ukraine. The problem with Putin is he wanted to restore ancient Russia, mm. uh, imperial Russia. Yeah. And that mean, meant he needed not only all of Ukraine, but most of Eastern Europe as well. I mean, he had ambitions for the whole damn lot, um, which obviously the West didn't want and Ukraine didn't want. They could have come to an agreement like two years ago where you split Ukraine and have Western Ukraine as a part of Europe, and of course, Eastern Ukraine as a part of Russia. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at it rationally, that would have been a logical division. But of course, Russia would not accept that because that was not what he wanted. Ukraine would not want that because they would, didn't want to be divided. And so I, you would never get that agreement, I'm pretty sure. It just wouldn't even get off the ground. Um, and so, and, and Russia just wouldn't uh, uh, agree to only not even a half of what they wanted, but a quarter of what they wanted. Uh, mm. So that that idea would never have have flown. And so mm. we end up in this situation where he decided to go in and to take the whole lot. Yeah, I mean and, the whole the whole the whole thing to me seems uh, suspicious. I mean, you know, with the Azov Battalion, the Nazis. Um, then you have that the Jew guy. What's he? The Jewish guy. What's his name? The Zol Voldemort Zelensky. Zelensky. Yeah, that guy. That guy is just an actor or something. I mean, he doesn't even seem mm. like a like a president. Like the whole damn thing was set up or something, you know. And they just dumped billions and billions of dollars there. I I I, I don't I don't think it was set up, but I think. I think the West in in part led. Uh, Putin down this road because remember from the West point of view and younger viewers probably won't know the severity of this but Russia has been a, a pain in the ass to the West for 70 years um, <clears throat> the whole of the Cold War was caused by Russia um, our opposition to Russia, but it wasn't just the Cold War. The Vietnam War was Russian. The Korean War was Russian. They were using these people as proxy armies in order to no attack the West. Um, Cuba, you remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Yom Kippur War, Russian. This, uh, the Six-Day War, 
Russian because it was Russia that was arming the opposition in order to go and attack Israel. They were all mm. Russia sponsored. Um, and so, and all of the strikes we had in Britain and the loss of our industry, uh, which brought Britain to the, its knees in the 80s, 70s and 80s, because we, you know, we were a leading industrial nation. All yeah. of that was caused by Russia. There was lots of Russian, Russian agitators in the unions that were trying to bring Britain down. So Russia has been a complete pain to the West, uh, costing us trillions and trillions of dollars over those 70 years to prevent the expansion of, of Russia and their involvement in Western affairs. And so for many people, this was just a continuation of the Cold War. It was the last battle in the Cold War. Mm. And they wanted to punish Russia because they had cost us so much in terms of lives as well as money. You were Korean War and the Vietnam War, how many people died in those wars. Um, never in any of those wars did Russia have to fight, mm. apart from, you might say, Afghanistan. But in all of the other wars, they just acted as a proxy. Uh, hmm. Sorry, they used other people as a proxy. They used the Vietnamese, they used the Koreans, they used the Cubans. And yeah. they never actually had to do any fighting themselves. No. And now it's the tables have been turned and we're using Ukraine as a proxy to go and fight Russia. So this is payback for the whole of the Cold War. Now, people might wow. say, that's stupid, you can't do that. I don't agree with that. You might be right, but that is what is happening. This is the last chapter in the long-running Cold War dispute between Russia and the West. And really? Russia is paying the price because they thought their army was invincible, although they should have known better because of um, because of the Israeli wars, because of the Six-Day War and the Yom Kippur War. I've always said for decades, I've said that it was Israel that saved Europe from World War Three, <clears throat> because all of those attacks on Israel uh, were with Russian equipment, and it was decimated. It was completely and utterly decimated. Okay. And so Russia should have got the idea that their equipment is not quite as good as they thought it was. And then, of course, we had Desert Storm and the uh, Second uh, Iraqi War. Uh, which was, again, it was all Russian equipment that was owned by Saddam. And, of course, America, and to a lesser extent Britain, but mostly America goes in there with the Abrams tank and the, um, what's the army personnel carrier they use, which is quite effective. Anyway, APC. they go in with the, the which one? APC, uh, Bradley. Yeah, there's the Bradley. And they go in there, and in the, Battle of, is it 51st East, Easting or something? Mm -hmm. Anyway, they had this battle and they went in and there was complete mayhem and they went through. And at the end of the day, I think America lost one Bradley and the Iraqis lost like 450 tanks or something. Wow. It was it was a turkey shoot. It was a complete and utter, utter turkey shoot, which yeah. again convinced some people in Russia that, you know, maybe you shouldn't be starting World War Three if this is what happens to your equipment. I mean, the same happened in the um, uh, in the Yom Kippur War. Um, Syria came in with hundreds of tanks, and the Israelis had, I think, they had something like seven or eight tanks sitting on top of a, a, a slight ridge overlooking this valley, okay. and they picked off hundreds of Syrian tanks between them. They called it the um, the Valley of Tears afterwards because there were so many destroyed tanks sitting in this valley, all destroyed by half a dozen Israeli tanks sitting on this ridge. Again, hmm. the Russian equipment was just completely and utterly wiped out. And yeah, that yeah. saved us from World War Three because it convinced some people in the Russian military that their equipment would not stand up against Western military in, in Europe. 
Do you and consider- now they've proved it. You know, obviously the, the the Russian military don't make the um uh don't make the decisions. That's you know finally made by Putin. He is the dictator. He can tell them what to do. And he said, "I want <laughs> to go into Ukraine." And his equipment has not performed. But mm. I told him they, they this would happen. When it actually happened, as soon as they moved into Ukraine, I said the Russian army is going to get kicked. And everyone said, you know, that's rubbish. You know, the size of their army, they've got a million men, they've got 20,000 tanks, all of this sort of business. I said, yeah, but what's the quality of these tanks? What's the serviceability of these tanks? Because I used to live in Russia. I've seen their equipment. Mm. And... I was involved in manufacturing over there. And their equipment was utterly and utterly hopeless. The designs were good, but the fabrication, they would cut a corner on everything. So nothing ever worked. You know, their serviceability was absolutely terrible. Um, Their serviceability of their jet engines, you know, we were getting, I think, we were getting thousands of hours um, out of our jet engines. Um, one of our Rolls-Royce engines did 20,000 hours on the wing without being taken off. Russians were getting about 350 hours out of their jet engines. Mm. The difference in quality was just absolutely enormous. <clears throat> and that quality differential ran through the whole of their military. So there's there's no point having... 20,000 tanks if 15,000 of them don't work right? because they're unserviceable. And a lot of them were in storage anyway, so they were going to be pretty unserviceable. And the ones that you do manage to get working are inferior because their range is inferior, their firing system, uh, the aiming system is inferior, their um, stabilization for the gun barrel is uh, inferior. And so they're just going to get wiped out again. And that's exactly yeah. what's happened. Um, and so, yeah, the the, uh, the great Russian bear has come up against, I don't know what you would call it, the uh, Ukrainian fox, and got mauled completely. Uh, let me ask They've you this. They've been put back in their box. I mean, do you consider yourself uh, a Zionist in any way? I'm just asking. Yeah, um, I would go along with that. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm a hit... Uh, a student of history, and we've been through some of the history of, of the uh, Old Testament, and uh, it's clear to me that the Israelites were the original people in that location. So if you're talking about looking for an indigenous population, then, of course, the Israelis have to be at the top of that. Um, if you're looking for a population who desperately needs somewhere to live because they've been pushed from pillar to post over the last 2,000 years. More than that, they got kicked out of Israel by the uh, Babylonians, of course, 600 BC. They got kicked out of Israel um, after the uh, Jewish revolt in AD 70, and they were all taken into captive around the uh, Roman Empire. And then they were kicked out again in about 135 with the um, uh, Bar Kokhba uprising in Israel. That's why we ended up with all of these Jewish... Uh, communities all around Europe. They were all taken around Europe by the Romans. I mean, this was, you might declare it's the Romans' fault because they they put all of these Israelite communities all over the Roman Empire. Uh, you... And they did rather well. I have to say that everywhere they end up, you know, the Israelites, the Jews normally do very well. And they did very well. And then, of course, they kept themselves to themselves and people were jealous and they were put in charge. They were specifically put in charge of banking by a lot of mm-hmm. European countries because under strict Roman Catholic um, uh, policies, you're not allowed to deal in usury, uh, usury, sorry, wrong pronunciation again. So you're not allowed to deal in banking. Mm-hmm. But there was a loophole that said, well, someone else can do it. And the Jews looked at the uh, same verses and said, well, it doesn't count if we do usury for someone else, only if we 
it's only forbidden if we do it for ourselves. And so it was very convenient that they were religiously able to deal with banking. And so they became the um, bankers of Europe. But that was by design, not because they forced them their, their way into that. So they became uh, successful in many countries. And then obviously people were resentful. And the, we had all of those pogroms against the uh, Jews because of that. And yeah, so they yeah. were kicked from pillar to post. They were exiled from countries all over the place. Um, Britain took Wouldn't. them back in again after the Reformation. So we would, uh, took them back in. Um, <clears throat> they were instrumental in, in some of the reforms uh, within Europe. Um, so an interesting one is the um, city of Orange down in the south of France, uh, which was run by the princes of Orange. Now, the princes of Orange were Jewish, according to hmm. Wolfram von Eschenbach. Hmm. Uh, Orange is a city in the south of France, but it was an independent principality. But it was the princes of Ol Orange who kicked the Muslims out in the 8th century. Wow. So the original battle was by Charles Martel at the Battle of Tours, where he kicked the um, uh, the Muslims out back into Spain. But they mm. came back into uh, southern France again in the um, uh, late 8th century. And it was the Princes of Orange who kicked them out on the second occasion. Wow. Um, because obviously it was in their interest to, you know, you know, the animosity that's always been there between Islam and and uh, and the Israelites, the Jews. It was in their interest to to do that on behalf of Europe. So yeah, interesting history. But here's a people who don't have a homeland. They got severely mauled by by Hitler and his uh, minions during the Second World War, and so people were actively saying these people need their own place to go to, their own homeland. Yeah, and some uh, people suggested Madagascar. They were going to send them to Madagascar. Some people were going to send them to, uh, was it Uganda? Yeah, I think it was Uganda they were going to go to Uganda. But there were... Yeah, sorry. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. That's, that's fascinating. <laughs> um, I mean, I was thinking... Yeah, they were going to go to... Yeah. They were desperate to send them somewhere, but there were lots of problems with sending them to Uganda, and they didn't really want to go to Uganda. That wasn't really their homeland. And as they said, quite rightly, you know, it, it might be relatively free land at present, but what about the future? You know, we're, we're going to be colonizers, mm -hmm. and you know what's happened to African colonies, you know? They're all being pushed out of, of Africa, even in the... Uh, early 20th century. And so it was decided to put them back into Israel, which is where they came from. That was their homeland. They'd only been kicked out of there by the Romans in AD 70 and AD 135. So yeah. that was chosen as, as the place to put them back. Well, I guess and they're God remember, was sleeping. No, in yeah, 70 AD, the, I mean. In 70 yeah. AD, uh, they, their God must have fell asleep or something. Oh, he did on many occasions. I mean, they've been kicked <laughs> from pillar to post. I remember the um, exodus out of Egypt. They were kicked out of Egypt. Um, they were they were kicked out of um, Israel by the Babylonians and by the uh, by the by the Romans on two occasions. Yeah. So they managed to get back to Israel. Um, and Israel was relatively unpopulated at the time, mm. so it really wasn't a problem. Um, so they, they took over those lands. And of course, the first thing that happened, this is back in, 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 in 48, 1948, they were immediately attacked by all of the nations around Israel, mm. by Jordan, by Syria, by uh, Egypt, um, mm. and by Lebanon. Well, no, I suppose not, in, not at that time by Lebanon. But anyway, um, they were attacked on all sides and they won despite having no army, uh, having no um, <clears throat> military at all, uh, because America was being a little bit anti at that, that time. They, they weren't allowing them to have any military equipment. No. Nobody was funding them a military equipment. So they had to go out onto uh, the world market and buy some military equipment. 
So mm. they ended up buying some old Spitfires from Britain, um, which came through a third country. I don't think they came from Britain. And they bought um, German and uh, secondhand German fighters from mm. hung Hungary, I think, or or, or Czechoslovakia or some one of those two nations. And so they had this mixed bag of different um, uh, military equipment. They had no tanks, so they bought old Shermans. Oh. But the Sherman was a crappy tank from, from day one. It had a stupid uh, pea shooter on the front of it. So they put a, a British 17-pounder uh, on the top of a Sherman and turned it into a Firefly. And it turned out to be a very useful tank. Um, this uh, sort of combination between two tanks and they put it together. So they made all of this equipment um, yes. and defeated all of their enemies. And then they did the same in the uh, Six Day War and they did the same in the Yom Kippur War. And so they were highly successful. They were but what's not, yeah, I mean, what's yeah. not mentioned is that we have this problem with Palestinian refugees. Yep, they're coming here. Ask, well, you have to ask yourself, Excuse why me. on earth are there refugees? This was from 70 years ago. Mm. Why are there Palestinian refugees still after 70 years? I mean, we're two generations on from the uh, setting up of Israel. Um, it's because the Muslim states want to maintain this war over in Israel. And so nobody would take in these, what they call Palestinians. They're not Palestinians. They're Arabs, of course. Nobody in the bordering nations, none of the Muslim uh, states would take in any of these refugees. Um, they went into Jordan. So the Palestinian refugees went into Jordan. And Jordan bombed them back into Israel again mm. because they caused so much of a uh, a problem over there. They went mm. into Lebanon and they completely destroyed Lebanon, ended up with a civil war there, which went on for 25 years, more, 30 years. Mm. Um, and still they've got these refugees supposedly still uh, within the West Bank and within Gaza. Now, what they won't tell you is that at the same time as we had these Palestinian refugees, there were more than half a million Jews were kicked out of North Africa, out of Iraq, out of Iran, and out of Syria, uh, and out of Egypt. They had half a million Jews were kicked out of these nations in the 1940s and the 1950s. Mm. Um the last king of Iraq, Jewish king of Iraq, Exilarch, they used to call him, was the Jewish king of Iraq. He was kicked out in the 1960s, kicked out of Iraq. Um, and he had a, a claim in with the UN for $26 billion of lost assets for when he was kicked out of Iraq. Man. Now, all of those people went to Israel. And they were all absorbed and taken into Israel, and they are Israelis. Now, Israel could say they're still refugees. No, they're not refugees because they were taken in, and they're you know successful people within Israel itself. They're just normal Israeli citizens. They solved the refugee problem in the space of ten years. The Muslim side of this has exacerbated this problem for 70 years and kept these people separate as refugees because they want to keep this dispute going. They are mm. using these refugees as a proxy army in order to kick Israel. And they do that because if you kick Israel, they know that you're kicking America as well. Wow. So you kick, you kick the little Satan, which is Israel, so that effectively you're kicking the big Satan, the great Satan, which is America. Saudi mm. Arabia and Iraq and places like this cannot kick America. But mm. they can kick Israel in order to upset America. And that's exactly what they're doing. I can tell you. It, it, it's, uh, 
it's amazing what's going on. I mean, it's not amazing. It's kind of I almost said messed. It's messed up, but I wanted to use the F word, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, but yeah, it's it's yeah, uh, messed, whole, messed up. It is messed. Yeah, up. yeah, it's messed up. It's uh, I mean, I just wish all the fighting would stop and everything would come to come to an end over there. But what I'm gonna do? Look, I would talk. I'd love to talk to you all day, but I've got his shows coming up in 30, 20 minutes, and I think he, he's uh, <laughs> right. Okay, yeah. yeah. So he's like, hey man, my show, yeah, my show's coming up, but <laughs> yeah, he's got uh, he's doing the uh, the the call in today. Uh, uh, yes, but, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, so it, but but Saturday your call ins at two o'clock and uh we're we're advertising on Facebook. Um I put an ad out on Facebook and I've got a, a really good response. Uh people want to come in and talk to you and ask you questions. Of course they'd be screened when they come in because we don't want anybody on there that's doing a prank or something, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, because they do do that. And uh, oh, I'm sure. Yeah, and uh but everyone here, I mean there's more questions here. We can hit one more real quick. Let's see, just pick one out of the blue. Okay. I wonder if Israel might disappear. I think the elites are more intent on creating trade routes like a unified Kurdish land. Maybe just Israel is just a football in the me. A foothold in the Middle East. Yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, yeah, it is. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I got the wrong glasses on. So it's farther. <laughs> I mean, I can see clo these are for close and they make everything blurry far away. Um, yeah. I mean, they, they are the only Western democratic nation within the Middle East and, and people ought to acknowledge that. Uh, but just, just one thing people need to understand is this is not a 70 year old problem. The Islamic states have been fighting Israel for 1,300 years. And that's how long this has been going on. So this is not a recent dispute. This is a dispute that's been going on for mm -hmm. a thousand years. And so the deep roots of this problem go way back into the formation of Islam. And we can talk about that later, but this is not a recent dispute. Um, about recent politics or oil or gas or anything like that this is an old dispute that goes back into ancient history and that needs to be borne in mind when people are trying to find a fix because if a fix if, if if a problem has been going on for a thousand years you're not gonna solve it by a a, a few sweet plat platitudes you know by aoc or something like that yeah um they don't understand the gravity of this problem. And if people want to understand the, this problem, again, this is not highlighted on uh, mainstream media, go on to Memory TV, M E R I T V dot com or dot org or something. Memory TV. And what they do is they record all of the television programs in the Middle East, especially in the Palestinian states. Watch what they are telling their people. It's nothing but raw hatred from start to finish, not mm. just of Jews, but of all uh, unbelievers. That is the uh, propaganda they are pumping out to their people. Watch it and see what they're learning, and then you'll see what the problem is. Yeah, what we what we should do, what we could do is uh, once a week have a uh, a show on you know, we pick some topics of the world news and go, we go over them because yeah. it's so interesting. Yeah, that would be fun. Do, do, a, do a memory TV special. That would be yes. good. And let's, let's talk about it and discuss it. <laughs> that, would, that would be awesome, man. That, it, it's it, it's uh, so great to have you on the show, especially on the channel. <laughs> and, and you're always welcome. Um, one, of the, one of our, uh, I mean, fantastic. I mean, I don't know what word to describe you. Just uh, treasure trove of knowledge. You know what I mean? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting. But hey, what we're going to do is everybody, we're ending the show now because we have to, because uh, Dr. Price's show comes up in 15 minutes. And uh, <laughs> right. yeah, so everybody out there, thank y'all for tuning in. And, and, you're, um, and, we, and we thank you for uh, your comments, your questions, and feel free to leave comments and questions. We'll answer them later. Hey, thank you so much. Thanks for having me on the show. See you again soon. Mm -hmm.